You are listening to A Promise So Sweet, a sweet Christian romance written by Andrea Boyd and narrated by Mike Monster AI. Lydia Osborne had never been so glad to be at a funeral. Not for morbid reasons, of course. It was just. Well, for one thing, as funerals went, this one wasn't that bad. More like a celebration, actually. Miss Edwina Watkins had lived life to the fullest, never missing the opportunity for adventure. She'd traveled the world, serving as a missionary for most of her lifetime and then spent the last part preparing others to go out into the field. She used to say she wanted to live until God had squeezed out everything she had to give, and she wanted to die just before her 100th birthday because the thought of having a triple-digit birthday made her feel old. It seemed the good Lord had seen fit to oblige. Miss Watkins died in her sleep just hours before she would have turned 100. Lydia had enjoyed playing turn-of-the-century hymns in her honor while the congregation sang along. Hopefully, the old tunes would drown out the earworm that had been drumming through her head for the last several weeks, the wedding march, the second reason she was glad to play at a funeral for a change. It seemed that every previously unattached couple in Snow Village had decided this was the year to tie the knot, and she hadn't gotten the memo. It was bad enough that all her friends from college had gone down the aisle before her, but now her best friend and roommate, Tawny, was planning her wedding as well. Lydia really would be the odd woman out after that blessed event. She hadn't even been on a date in five years. It would be just her and her poodle, Fifi. Together, forever. Maybe she should start collecting cats now, because she was surely meant to be that woman. It would be fine if she could walk around with blinders on, completely oblivious to the wedded bliss all around her, but she had been pulled in from every angle. Bridesmaid requests, orders from the chocolate shop where she worked to be served to wedding guests, and if she had to play the wedding march one more time. With a sigh, Lydia stacked the music books she'd brought with her and shoved them into her tote. Now wasn't the time to cry over the ending of an unfulfilled dream. With the funeral over she was free to go home to her dog, a bowl of Cherry Garcia ice cream, and a Netflix movie marathon. Lydia slid the straps of her purse and her tote over her shoulder and was just about to step around the wall that the piano hid behind when she heard the unmistakable voice of Mrs. Gina Coletto, the one person in Snow Village, Colorado Lydia knew for certain didn't like her, though she had no idea why. You are coming to the wedding, aren't you, dear? Bruce will be there. I'm sure you two would like to catch up. Lydia sat down hard on the piano bench. Bruce Coletto the only serious relationship she'd ever had with a man. The one she'd thought she would end up marrying. The one she'd loved. Had even thought he'd loved her too until he broke up with her and moved to North Carolina. No warning. No signs. Just tossed aside for seminary studies. How is Bruce? I haven't seen him in years. Lydia didn't need to be able to see past the partition, hiding her from view, to know who that voice belonged to either. Callista Fisher was the type of woman who had every other Christian woman praying forgiveness for the cruelest of sins, jealousy. Tall, blonde, and a sweet personality to boot. No wonder Mrs. Coletto had spent years trying to reel Callista in for one of her three boys, and it hadn't seemed to matter which one. It may also answer to why she found a petite brunette like Lydia lacking. Well, Mrs. Coletto, she thought, Bruce is your last hope for landing Callista as a daughter-in-law, you'd better freshen your bait. The aforementioned wedding was for Mrs. Coletto's middle son, and her eldest had already tied the knot two years ago. Mrs. Coletto lowered her voice, and even though she knew she shouldn't, Lydia leaned closer to the partition to capture what was said. He's about to move up from youth pastor to senior pastor at the church where he works. It's just another step toward a bigger church. Maybe even one of those mega churches in Denver. You know, where they telecast all over the world. Is that what he's hoping for? Good question. Oh, you know, he hasn't said exactly what his plans for the future are. If you ever heard him preach though, you couldn't doubt that he is meant for something big. He'll be officiating Jason and Irina's wedding, so please say you'll come. I know he'd love to see you. And I know for a fact that he isn't bringing a date. He and his girlfriend broke up a couple of months ago. Just between you and me, I knew the first time I met her that she wasn't the one. 
probably the same thing she thought about me. Lydia could just imagine the Cheshire grin Mrs. Coletto must be wearing. How would Callista respond to this obvious setup? And what would Bruce think about his mom trying to find him a date? Oh, I'm definitely going to the wedding. I'll be sure to speak to Bruce too. It'll be good to catch up on everything that's happened since high school. So, she took the bait. Thankfully, Lydia wouldn't be there to witness the reunion. It was possibly the one wedding in all of Snow Village that she hadn't been invited to. No doubt the reason for it stood on the opposite side of the partition. Or it could be because of Bruce. She had to admit, it would be awkward seeing him again. That's wonderful. Well, I need to get home and walk the dog, though I dread it. Can you believe how cold it's been? And November just started. Mrs. Coletto's voice faded with each word, letting Lydia know she was finally walking away. She'd give it a few minutes, before leaving to make sure the woman was really gone. She turned the volume back up on her phone and noticed a text from her sister, Mary. Come by the house. I made mom's soup. Mom's Zuppa Toscana. The epitome of Lydia's best memories of their mother, both their parents, actually. Her mom would make what she considered the best of her Italian family's recipes, including this soup, and their non-Italian dad would always joke that her cooking was the sole reason he married her. They both died in a plane crash when she was 16. The soup would make her miss them all over again, but it would be a comfort all the same. Lydia gripped the straps of her purse and tote, then peeked around the partition before making a beeline for the door. If someone saw her and realized she'd been eavesdropping, so be it. Nothing was going to stand between her and that soup. Less than five minutes later, she stepped through her sister's front door. Warmth, along with the smell of Italian sausage, enveloped her. The bare Christmas tree in the corner of the living room caught her eye as she shed her boots and wool coat. She grinned at Mary. Now I know why you lured me here with mom's soup. You want me to drag the decorations down from the attic. You know it's only the second day of November don't you? This is early, even for you. Mary rubbed her bulging belly. I wanted to get it done before the baby gets here. And I'll have you know I've already brought the decorations down. She stuck her tongue out at Lydia. I just felt like making soup. Lydia looked at the boxes lined up next to the wall. Mary had been going through the house, clearing out unwanted items. She'd thought this was more of the same, but now Lydia noticed some of them were marked Christmas. You know Jace won't be happy about you climbing up into the attic. Jace doesn't have to know. So now the real truth comes out. You call me over here, to help deceive your hubby, make him think I did all this. She gestured to the boxes. Her gaze caught on a dark blue denim sleeve hanging from one of the boxes. She tugged the dress her sister had bought last winter the rest of the way out of the box. It had been one of Lydia's favorites. Why is this in here? Doesn't look like Christmas decorations to me. Mary jerked the dress out of Lydia's hand and stuffed it back in the box. That box is meant for the caring center. I may have cleaned my closets out today too. You only wore it a couple of times, if that. Mary made a face and I'm already tired of looking at it. You won't stay pregnant forever. What are you going to wear then? I'll have to go shopping, of course. It was all Lydia could do to bite her tongue. After their parents died, Mary had gone through her part of their inheritance like tissues during flu season. Though it chaffed at the time, Lydia hadn't been able to touch her own inheritance until she turned 18 two years later. By that time, she'd seen what could happen. It had caused her to be more careful with her own money. Mary had learned her lesson the hard way. She was better about not throwing money away now, but she couldn't seem to control herself when it came to fashion. Lydia pulled the dress back from the box. I want this dress then. What else do you have in here? Mary took the dress from her and stuffed it back into the box. You know my clothes are too big for you. When's the last time you bought an outfit? one that actually fits. Lydia huffed. Do you know how many bridesmaids' dresses I own now? And they all fit just fine. 
That doesn't count, since we both know you'll never wear them again. True. Let's go shopping tomorrow. Let me pick a few things out for you that are guaranteed to grab you a boyfriend before Christmas. A man who only likes me for my clothes? No thanks. He'd probably ask to borrow a blouse or something one day. That's not the kind of man I'd want. Mary tapped her on the shoulder. That's not what I meant, and you know it. I'll tell you what, let me go through these clothes, and I won't say a word to Jace about who really brought down the decorations from the attic. Blackmail, huh? Okay, but first, soup. I'm starving. Deal. Lydia looped her arm through Mary's and led them toward the kitchen. Clothes to add to her wardrobe and her mom's soup. It was enough to make anyone forget about Bruce and his snooty mother. Not that there was any reason to think about them in the first place. She hadn't seen Bruce in almost a decade. So why is he still taking up space in your head, silly girl? Bruce's heart nearly hammered out of his chest as he approached the dark blue door of the cottage-style home. Just the thought of ringing the doorbell caused him to nearly lose control of the styrofoam cup he now held with two hands. He took a deep breath to settle his nerves. How bad could it be? He'd make the offer and if it didn't sound like something she'd be interested in, she would just say no and send him on his way. There was a chance she could spread his foolish notion all over Snow Village, but he didn't live here anymore, so, so, he'd go back to North Carolina with his tail between his knees and his hopes for the future shattered to ruins. He ran his hand over his face, blew out the breath he'd been holding, and knocked on Lydia's door before he could change his mind. A yapping bark that could only come from a small dog sounded from inside. He heard an interior door shut and then quiet. A few seconds later she was standing across the threshold from him. Her dark brown eyes widened in obvious surprise, but she quickly schooled her features. Her black hair was much shorter and curlier than it had been in high school. She seemed smaller somehow. Or maybe it was the sweatshirt she wore that was at least two sizes too big. Lydia had always dressed so stylishly and right now she looked, well, frumpy. Yet, he still found her as attractive as ever. His heart sang in his chest that coming here was the right thing to do and his head asked why he hadn't done so before now. Bruce, coming out of the cold. She gestured for him to enter and then self-consciously combed her fingers through her hair. I'm afraid I had already settled in for the evening. I know I must look a mess. I wasn't expecting anyone. If he was a betting man, he'd put every penny he had on her never expecting to see him at her door. I would have called first, but I didn't have your number. He hadn't dared ask anyone who might have had it, either. It would have raised too many questions. Bruce held the cup out to her. I stopped by Brew Natural and picked up your favorite. Or, uh, it used to be your favorite. She flipped the tab on the top of the disposable lid, sniffed it, and then took a sip. Dancer's Delight Did you know it's basically the same thing as Celestial's Nutcracker Sweet? He grinned. Don't tell me my little tea snob is using tea bags now. My little tea snob. The old endearment had just rolled off his tongue, but the weird look she gave made him wish he could take it back. Yeah, well, I grew up and found out convenience trumps tea snobbery. Besides, Celestial is packaged right here in Colorado. It feels right to support them. She shrugged one shoulder. I still drink the loose leaf tea when I'm at home in the afternoons and on weekends. It feels more special that way. He nodded. The tea was meant to be an icebreaker, but things had turned more awkward by the minute. Come on in and have a seat. She gestured toward one of the chairs in her small living room and then sat down at the end of the couch. I imagine you're here for your brother's wedding. I mean, here in Colorado, not here at my house. Her voice had gotten weaker toward the end and seemed to end abruptly. No doubt, she had a million questions running through her mind. A million more ran through his own about how she'd respond once she found out his reason for coming. Lydia, I know you're wondering why I'm here so let me get to the point. She crossed one leg over the other and leaned toward him. He stared at her, but no words came. He had everything down to the last syllable worked out before coming here. 
why couldn't he think of a single one now? Are you going to tell me, or am I supposed to guess? I, uh... He blew out a breath. I have a proposal I want to run by you. It's a little crazy, but I hope you'll at least hear me out all the way to the end and then take the time to think about it. Uh, and pray about it. Okay. She leaned back and took a sip of her tea, but it looked more like someone faking relaxation, not someone who actually felt at ease. You may have heard that I have been a youth pastor for the last four years. She nodded, but he could almost see the wheels turning as she tried to figure out what that had to do with his visit. I know you must love it. You've always been good with kids. It's one of the things I always L liked about you. She blushed and his heart did a little jig. I do love it, but now there is a chance I'll get to step up and really make a difference. He swallowed hard and rubbed his palms down his slacks. The senior pastor position is about to become available at my church. There are a few things I need to work on between now and the end of the year if I want to be considered for the job. She frowned. Is that really the job you want? It's what I went to seminary school for. It's just, you're so young. He gave a half-hearted laugh. I'll be 30 in January. That's almost halfway to retirement. His age had come up when he'd spoken to his mentor who just happened to be on the pastor-seeking committee, but people had become senior pastors at his age before. The calling to do more for God weighed so heavily on him, he was willing to do whatever it took to get there, including coming here. Bruce, I'm happy for you, and I wish you all the best, but what does this have to do with me? I mean, I haven't seen you in, what? Almost ten years? And you just show up at my door, she shook her head. Maybe if you could just tell me why you're here, it would put my mind at ease and then we can circle back around to your career. The press of her lips. The wrinkles in her forehead. The flaring of her nose, even. She worn a coolly polite facade since the moment he entered her house, but if he could still read her after all these years, her patience was wearing thin. I came here to ask you, um, to possibly, think about marrying me? Lydia leapt to her feet as if on marionette strings. What? Whining and scratching came from behind one of the closed doors, which they both ignored. Bruce stood, taking a step toward her to take her by the hand. Lydia, please, just hear what I have to say. She looked down at their joined hands with a frown and he let go. Please, let's sit back down and I'll explain. As she returned to her chair, he took note of her pale features. It was easy to see he'd shocked her. He tried to think of some way to bring this subject up without it coming as such a surprise, but there was no getting around it. As she'd said, they hadn't seen each other in years, and it had been even further back when he'd broken up with her. The truth is, when I spoke to one of the committee members about this, my age did come up as a concern, but also the fact that I'm not married. I've thought and prayed it through, and everything keeps circling back to you. I believe God is telling me that you are the one. I'd like to explore that option. She let out a huff. So you want to start dating again? You know, you could have done it the normal way. Hey, Lydia, what do you think about us dating? Or even, just ask me out on a date and if I say yes and things go well, ask me for another. That's not exactly what I had in mind. I mean, I want us to go on dates, but it'd be more like speed dating. Speed dating? Despite the look of horror that just crossed her face, he continued. Yeah, we go on several dates while I'm here. Maybe you fly to North Carolina for more dates and I'll be back for Thanksgiving. Everything would lead up to us possibly getting married by the end of the year. This year? Have you lost your mind? She jumped up from her seat again and paced away from him. Is this some kind of joke? Some kind of Lizzie Mr. Collins reenactment? People don't just ask other people they don't have a relationship with to marry them, Bruce. Not anymore. Do you really think I'm that desperate? Lizzie Mr. Collins? As soon as it hit him, he almost laughed. She'd always been a huge fan of Jane Austen. Back in high school, he'd studied up on the author's works just as a means of winning Lydia over. I'm no Mr. Collins. She turned to face him and threw her hands up. 
you got that right. He at least had the excuse of being ignorant. You don't. He rubbed his chest. Direct hit. He walked over to her. All I'm asking is for you to give it a try. We'll do as you said. We'll go on a few dates while I'm in town. If that goes smoothly, we'll continue. If at any point you decide I'm not the one for you, I'll mark it up as God's will and I won't pressure you. She closed her eyes. Bruce, I told you years ago when we were dating that I wanted a marriage like my parents had. I told you that I wanted to be a wife and mother more than I wanted a career. It's like you're only coming to me because you think I'll easily give in. But there's a huge difference. My parents loved each other. Her hand whipped out to the side. Their marriage was nothing like the loveless model you have in mind. He took her by the hand, and she looked up at him. Let me be perfectly clear, Lydia. A loveless marriage is the last thing I want. I promise you that if I'm not madly in love with you by the end of the year, I'll call things off myself. She shook her head. I don't know. I just don't know. I'm not asking you to tell me if you'll marry me or not right this minute. Let's just take this one decision at a time. The first one is, will you go out on a few dates with me this weekend? I have to work until noon tomorrow. I'll think about it between now and then and let you know. About a date. That's it. She flicked her hand as if shooing at a pesky fly. Not about this crazy scheme of yours. Do you want to grab lunch at the 520 Grill and talk about it? Is that your way of sneaking in a first date? Depends on your answer when I see you tomorrow. He found a glimmer of hope in her half-smile. Like he said, he had prayed about this and the almost grin was like getting a green flag from God. Text between Lydia and her friends. Lydia, you'll never guess who came to see me last night. Anna, who? Lydia, Bruce Coletto. Anna, who is that? Hannity, what did he want? Ruth and, your ex? Are you two getting back together? Layla, please tell me you slammed the door in his face. Kate, did he ask you out? I hope you said yes. Lydia, I don't know if it'll go anywhere, but I'm meeting him for lunch tomorrow. Prayers appreciated. What are you doing? Even if Lydia hadn't seen her roommate's name pop up on the screen of her phone, she'd recognize Tawny's voice anywhere. It reminded her of the soft-spoken character from the first Police Academy movie she'd sneaked and watched at a friend's house when she was a kid. Nothing. Just curled up with Fifi on the couch about to watch some PMP. Lydia didn't need to explain that PMP stood for Pride and Prejudice. The thing she and her roommate had most in common was their love for all things Jane Austen. It wasn't unusual for quotes to pop up in their everyday conversations. Ooh, which one? Is it the one with the dreamy Colin Firth or the Kira Knightley version? Kira Knightley. Good call. You wouldn't want to start the long version on a work night, cause you know you'll stay up all night watching till the end. If you give me a few, I'll pick us up something to eat and watch it with you. Sounds good, but I thought you were going out with Glenn tonight. He's out on a call. An old cabin burned. No one lived there, but they have to make sure the fire doesn't spread. I'm at Chauncey's. What do you want to eat? A gut buster burger with everything on it, a large order of fries, and a cherry cheesecake milkshake. Wow. Somebody must have had a rough day. Anything else? You have no idea. I think that ought to do it. Be there in a few. Rough day? Lydia shook her head and blew out a huff as she combed her fingers through Fifi's white, curly locks. The day had gone just fine up until Bruce Coletto showed up out of nowhere with his cockamamie scheme, touching on every hidden sore spot her heart contained. She'd always thought she'd be married by now. At one time, she'd thought she would be married to him. How could he think it was all right to ask her to marry him out of the blue like that? It was the craziest thing she'd ever heard of. Lydia heard the front door unlock. How much time had passed while she'd stared at Kira Knightley frozen mid-step with a book in her hand while drowning in her own thoughts? It had seemed like mere minutes, but had to have taken longer than that for Tawny to be walking in with food already. 
Her roommate came through the house like a whirlwind, dropping the takeout, her purse, and keys on the coffee table before running toward her bedroom with Fifi excitedly nipping at her heels. I'll be right back. Just let me get comfy. Will you shut Fifi up in my bedroom while you're back there? Sure thing. Lydia separated the shakes from the takeout carrier, placing one on the opposite end of the coffee table and taking a long draw from the other. Tawny's wrap was in the top of the takeout bag. Most people loaded their wraps with healthy fillings, but not Tawny. The girl never met a vegetable she was willing to consume. Lydia was alternating between salty fries and sips of the shake when Tawny returned, wrapping her black curly hair in a pink silk scarf that matched her PJs, pink plaid bottoms with a t-shirt that read Jane is my homegirl. Lydia looked down at her own choice of nighttime attire, an old ratty sweatshirt that had once belonged to Mary and a pair of leggings that had been accidentally splattered with bleach. Bruce saw me in this, and he still proposed? He must be really desperate. He must think I am too. She stuffed the rest of her fries into her mouth. Tawny quirked an eyebrow. I take it you've already blessed the food. Lydia shook her head and used her finger to push a wayward fry into her mouth. No worries. I'll take care of it. Tawny sat down in lotus position on the opposite end of the couch and clasped her hands together beneath her chin. Dear Lord, thank you for the day you've given. Thank you for your provision, for your loving guidance, and your care. Bless this food and the ones who prepared it. Please protect Glenn and the other firefighters. Please don't allow any sparks to ignite elsewhere. And dear Lord, give us all a good night's sleep tonight. I pray for my friend, Lydia, who seems to have had a particularly rough day. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Tawny's prayers shamed Lydia. Always so passionate, so thoughtful, while Lydia's all seemed to sound the same. Unless something bad happened. Then the words flowed easier. Did she need to have something bad happen just to have a decent connection with God? This was surely proof she was never meant to be a preacher's wife. Not that she was giving much credence to Bruce's proposal. He was off his rocker to suggest such a thing to begin with. She picked up the remote and started the movie. The beautiful music from this version of Pride and Prejudice usually washed over her, soothing away the anxiety of the day. Not this time. Tawny snickered. I still can't get over you being named after Lydia Bennett, of all people. Lydia took a huge bite of her burger to keep from responding. She regretted telling Tawny that now. Even she couldn't understand why her mother had named her and Mary after the two silliest girls Jane Austen had ever written into existence, Lydia Bennett and Marianne Dashwood, two women who had both been taken in by devious men. She wouldn't be following in their footsteps, that's for sure. Except. Bruce wasn't devious. He'd broken her heart and she somehow had never quite gotten over it, but he wasn't malicious. Nothing like the calculating Wickham or the good-for-nothing Willoughby. In no time at all, the reason for the sudden desire to watch this particular version of Pride and Prejudice arrived at the Bennett's door. Mr. Collins. The more acceptable version of Mr. Collins, in her opinion. Lydia scooted to the edge of her seat and rested her elbows on her knees. Poor Mary. She's probably thinking the same thing everyone else thinks. Why didn't Mrs. Bennett suggest her instead of Lizzie? She must have felt so misunderstood by her own mother. Do you think she and I are alike? You and Mary? Not at all. You both play the piano, but that's where the similarities end. Why'd you ask that? No reason. Hmm. Lydia slurped the last of her shake from the bottom of the cup. You know how we've always said Mary would have been a better choice for Mr. Collins? Well, I'd like to change my answer. Charlotte is perfect for him. She's a dummy for agreeing to marry him and that's just the sort of wife he deserves. Charlotte isn't dumb. Things were different back then. I think she did the best she could under the circumstances. Lydia peered over her shoulder at Tawny. Do you think she and Mr. Collins ever learned to really love one another? Tawny grabbed the remote and paused the movie before looking at Lydia. What's with the sudden interest in Mr. Collins? 
Bruce Coletto, showed up at the house, asking me to marry him. He what? Tawny slapped the leather couch cushion between them, causing Lydia to jump. At her loud exclamation, Fifi came to life, growling and scratching at the bedroom door. Lydia lifted from the couch to go free the anxious pooch. Tawny stopped her with a hand on Lydia's arm. The dog is fine. I need answers. Is this a joke? Are you seriously telling me that after years of not hearing from him, he just came here and proposed? Are you kidding me? No, I'm not. It really did happen. Bruce Coletto came here today, asking me to marry him. Well, not right away. He wants us to speed date for the next couple of months, but he wants to be married by the end of the year. Tawny sat there with her mouth gaped open for a full minute before she said anything. Why? She shook her head. You're going to have to start from the beginning before I can make sense of this. Did you even know he was coming here today? He just showed up at the door looking all cute with his slight overbite and dimples, telling me he has a chance of becoming senior pastor at his church, but he needs a wife if he wants to be taken seriously, and he chose me. Tawny glanced at the TV screen, no doubt making the connection between Bruce and Mr. Collins, and then looked back at Lydia. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. My thoughts exactly. Lydia grabbed the pillow at her back and hugged it to her stomach, already regretting the huge, fat-laden meal she'd just scarfed. So, he's suggesting what? A marriage of convenience? Let's forget for a minute that no one this day and age does that anymore. It doesn't seem like something a pastor, nor the church, would approve of. I don't think that's exactly what he has in mind. He promised that if he wasn't madly in love with me by the end of the year, we'd call the whole thing off. In that case, I think you should do it. What? She froze, staring at her roommate. Why? Tawny squeezed Lydia's hand. Because you're already in love with him. Why wouldn't you give it a go? I don't know what ever gave you that idea. I am not in love with Bruce. And there goes the eye roll. How could Tawny go from thinking Bruce was the idiot to thinking Lydia deserved the title more in an instant? It was enough to make anyone's head spin. And only added to the tension wrapping around her middle. Lydia, you talk about Bruce more than you realize. I've never even met the guy, and I bet I could point him out in a lineup. Maybe you're not as head over heels as you once were, but he's definitely not out of your system yet. I think you'd be a fool not to see where this thing goes. You might get your heart broken, but think about how it would be for the rest of your life if you didn't at least give him a chance. Where do you think you're going? Bruce's steps slowed to a stop halfway downstairs. His mother stood at the bottom of the stairs, blocking his path like an NFL linebacker. How had she even known to watch for him? His mom hadn't caught up with the notion that he was no longer a teenager and he didn't know what to do about it. He took the last remaining steps until he stood next to her. I'm meeting someone for lunch. I'll be back in a couple of hours. What about the wedding? That's over four hours away. I'll be back in plenty of time. But, her brown eyes narrowed, and he knew what was coming. Dreaded what was coming. She was about to demand details. He didn't want to disrespect his mom, but until Lydia gave her answer, he didn't want to share any of the particulars. The front door opened and his eldest brother, Mark, along with his wife, Haile, entered, giving just the distraction he needed for a clean getaway. He heard his mom saying, you never said who you were meeting, as he shut the door but pretended not to hear. Bruce pulled his coat closed and hurried to his bar car parked out on the street. With daytime temperatures below freezing, he probably should have worn a beanie, but he didn't want to show up to their first date in years with hat hair. Please let this be an actual date. Please, Lord, let her at least give me a chance. He arrived at the restaurant ten minutes early and grabbed the booth in the corner, hoping it would afford them more privacy. Whatever Lydia's decision turned out to be, the last thing he needed was for the news to carry back to his family before he was ready. And if she said no, there would be no reason for them to ever know. His right leg wouldn't stop bouncing, he chewed on the ends of his already raw fingers, and he had to hand a shredded napkin to the waitress for disposal the last time she checked on him. 
He glanced at his watch for the thousandth time and then the door. Would Lydia stand him up? How long would he sit there before giving up? Calm down. She's only three minutes late. His eyes scanned the table one more time for any debris left from the napkin he destroyed. When he looked back toward the door, there she was. He blew out a breath and everything within him settled. Lydia tossed her purse, scarf, and hat onto the bench seat. I can't believe how cold it is this early in November and it isn't even snowing yet. When she struggled to get out of her coat, he stood to help her. Thanks. No problem. You smell delicious, by the way. She turned her head to stare at him over her shoulder and heat crept up his chest. What a ridiculous thing to say. I meant, you smell like chocolate. Oh. One of the perils of working at the chocolate shop, I guess. She took the coat from him and folded it over the rest of her things on the seat and then slid into the booth. He would call that scent a perk rather than a peril but kept that thought to himself. He already done enough to make things awkward between them. She could take the lead on the conversation to come. As soon as he sat down, the server came by with a refill on his soda and took their food order. Once they were alone again, Lydia folded her hands on the table in front of her with a sigh. I've thought a lot about what you asked me yesterday. There are some things we need to go over before I make a final decision. Like? She looked him in the eye for the first time since she sat down. Bruce, have you talked this over with your family? I mean, I don't know why, but your mom still doesn't like me. Can you really marry someone she hates? She whispered the word marry like it was a bad word or something. Bruce cleared his throat. I wouldn't say she hates you. Lydia's eyebrows raised as she pursed her lips. Okay, so maybe her feelings don't go as deep as hate, but she certainly doesn't want me for a daughter-in-law. No argument there. He placed one of his hands over her folded ones. Look, I love and respect my mom. If she had ever given a viable reason why she objected to you, I'd like to think I would listen and take it into consideration, but she never has. If you agree to my proposal, I will talk to her about it. But know this, the opinion that matters most to me is God's. Her shoulders dropped with an audible exhale, but she didn't say anything, so he went on. Like I told you yesterday, I've prayed about this. If I didn't feel right about it, I never would have come to you with this. And I will continue to pray as we go along. I hope you will do the same. Bruce glanced around them to make sure no one was listening before continuing. Keep in mind, you can back out at any time. All I'm asking is for you to give me a chance. If this doesn't work out, if the day comes and you're not convinced my feelings for you are true, then you can call it off. Lydia leaned forward, her voice low. Bruce, you have to admit this plan of yours to be married by the end of the year is a crazy one. Once you start spreading the word around, everyone will wonder if I'm crazy or just desperate to get married to agree with such an arrangement. So, we won't tell them. He shrugged. He hadn't said anything to anyone else anyway. Everyone knows we were pretty serious before. They'll see us dating again and think we just picked up where we left off. I doubt it'll come as too much of a surprise if we happen to come to a quick decision that we belong together. Lydia pulled her hands from beneath his and leaned back in her seat. But why me? Why now? I mean, I still don't understand why you broke up with me back then. He could hear the hurt in her voice, see the pain in her expression. Was he asking too much of her? He knew she'd been heartbroken when he'd ended their relationship before. Part of him had been too. It would be even worse if it happened a second time. But there wouldn't be a second time. If this didn't pan out, it would be because she broke it off, not him. I was a fool, okay? I shouldn't have broken up with you. At the time, I thought it would be too much of a distraction. Maybe I was right. His leg bounced as his chest pounded with regret. Maybe it would have been harder for us to concentrate on our studies and uphold our relationship at the same time, but we could have figured it out. I realize that now, but at the time, I thought I was making the right decision for both of us. Bruce, we both finished college years ago, and you didn't try to get back together. He leaned closer. I'm here now. Give me a chance to make it up to you. I promise you won't regret it. She blew out a breath. I can't believe I'm doing this, but okay. She held up her index finger. One date at a time. 
That's all I can agree to for now so don't go setting a wedding date and sending out invitations just yet. He smiled and snapped his fingers. Too late. Those things went out weeks ago. Everyone's expecting us to say our vows day after tomorrow. She rolled her eyes and held back her grin. So, what did you have in mind for our first date? How about Jason's wedding this afternoon? I'm officiating, so I kinda have to be there. I marked plus one on the RSVP just in case. She laughed. Boy, you're putting me in hot water with your mom right from the start. Are you sure you even like me? More than you know. Text between Lydia and her friends. Lydia, he asked me to go with him to his brother's wedding. It's tonight and I have nothing to wear. Guys, what am I going to do? Kate, so y'all got back together? Ruth and I knew you would take him back given the chance. Good luck tonight, and if he breaks your heart again, tell him he can expect a call from me. Layla, you know I love you and hate saying this, but... Girl, you need a new wardrobe. Lydia, G. thanks. I know you're right. I'll work on it as soon as I can. Hannity, I can see you rocking the boho look. But go with what makes you feel confident. You got this. Anna, yeah, but that's not our Lydia. Shopping trip. I told him yes. We're going to date each other and see where it goes. Tawny, he asked me to his brother's wedding. Lydia drew in a sharp breath. He's picking me up in a little over two hours and I have nothing to wear. Why did I say yes? She leaned her forehead against the steering wheel. Calm down. Where are you? Sitting in the garage in my car. Why aren't you inside getting ready? Because my head is spinning with options and there are none. My closet is a showcase in what not to wear. I've got nothing. What am I going to do? Go inside and hop in the shower. I'll be there as soon as I can. No, you're with Glenn. Lydia took a deep breath. Just talking to her friend had helped already. No need in having Tawny change her plans just because of a crisis Lydia had brought on herself. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to pull you away from him. I just needed someone to talk me down and you're the only one who knows what's going on. Stop it. I want to help. Now look in my bathroom and get the essential oil marked calm. Put a few drops in your diffuser, then hop in the shower like I said. I'll be right there. Thank you. Lydia had showered and was blowing her hair dry by the time Tawny arrived in her typical whirlwind fashion. She went straight to Lydia's closet, flipping through every item hanging there. No swipe. No swipe. No swipe. Definitely not. A long stretch of silence followed, as she quickly shifted through the rest of Lydia's clothes. What are these ones covered in plastic? Bridesmaids' dresses. Definitely not, then. You don't want to look like one of the wedding party. You want something that will make his eyes light up when he sees you. Something romantic. Let me see what I have in my closet that might work. A fluttering went through Lydia's chest. How would Bruce react? And how could she tell if it was genuine? One of her fears about this whole arrangement was him faking his feelings to get to the end he wanted. Would he really sabotage his own future happiness by marrying someone he wasn't truly in love with? She couldn't imagine Bruce doing that. Then again, she'd never imagined him showing up after so many years apart asking her to marry him in two months, either. Tawny returned with a dress from her own closet for Lydia to try. She wiggled her eyebrows and bounced the hanger up and down in front of her, causing the silk dress to dance and shimmer. You can't go wrong with a little black dress, and the best part, this one has pockets. Do you want me to freeze to death? She eyed the sleeveless sheath. It'll be below zero out there before the night is over. Still, Lydia took the hanger from Tawny and held the dress up in front of her. The style was modest by today's standards, but considering what she normally wore, it may as well be a bikini. So, add a cardigan. Try it on, it may not even fit. We don't exactly have the same figure. Lydia rolled her eyes. 
That's just a nice way of saying I have the figure of a teenage boy. Now you're just being ridiculous. You have a figure. You just hide it beneath baggy clothes. Lydia slid the dress on over her bike shorts and cami. It fit fine in the waist, but was baggy on top, just as she'd suspected. Tawny tapped her index finger against her bottom lip as she looked the dress over. Huh, uh. That won't do, but mentioning the sweater has given me an idea. Go ahead and take that off, and I'll be right back. She stopped at the door and looked back over her shoulder. How tall is Bruce? He's about six inches taller than me. Perfect. Lydia slipped the dress over her head and placed it back on the hanger. Just as she laid it across the bed, Tawny returned with her arms loaded and a pair of black strappy heels dangling from her fingers. She spread a black cashmere sweater across the bed along with the heels, a beaded barrette with a small gray feather sticking out on one side, and a matching necklace. She whipped around and started flipping through the clothes in Lydia's closet again. Out came a gray tulle skirt, one of Mary's cast-offs that had to be pinned on the side just to keep it from sliding down to Lydia's hips. She'd yet to wear it because she couldn't figure out exactly what to pair with it. She had a feeling Mary had faced the same dilemma since the sales tag was still attached. Tawny tossed it across the bed. Get rid of the tags and put that on. After donning the skirt and sweater, Lydia looked at herself in the full-length mirror. She had to admit, she loved the soft feminine look. Would this make Bruce's eyes light up as Tawny had suggested? Tawny looked at her reflection from over Lydia's shoulder. Girl, he's going to love you in this. Love? The color drained from her face and jitteriness set in. What? What's the matter? She turned to face Tawny. This is happening. It's really happening. I'm about to date and possibly marry Bruce Coletto. In less than two months. I must be crazy to even think about doing this. Right? Calm down. This is just a date, that's all. No one is forcing you to marry him. It's just a date. She nodded and blew out a breath. You're right. It is just a date. If it goes badly, that will be the end of it. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Right? Right. Why don't you let me do your hair while you do your makeup? In other words, you're being overly dramatic, she thought. It's just a date. It's just a date. The mantra played tug of war with Lydia's anxiety all the way up until she opened the front door when Bruce knocked. Seeing him standing there in a tux, looking like one half of a wedding cake topper, she knew for sure that this was not just any old date. This was the man she would possibly spend the rest of her life with. Instead of her anxiety skyrocketing with the thought, everything within her settled. You look, his mouth opened then closed and his head moved slightly from side to side. Like a kid ready for prom? He reached for her elbow and let his hand slide down to hers as he took a step closer. His thumb skated across the back of her hand and she shivered. The way he stared at her lips, Lydia wondered if she was about to be kissed. Not at all. I was going to say you look amazing. Tawny entered the living room with her black faux fur coat and handed it to Lydia. Here, wear this tonight. It'll look great with what you have on. Lydia introduced them as she slipped into the coat with Bruce's help. She hugged Tawny and whispered her thanks. Tawny held on a little longer and whispered back. The way he's looking at you, I wouldn't be surprised if you announced your upcoming nuptials tonight. A spontaneous giggle erupted, and Lydia prayed Bruce didn't ask what Tawny had said. Yesterday, the whole idea of them marrying by the end of the year seemed ludicrous, but with the giddiness bubbling up right now, it felt like the end of the year couldn't come quickly enough. Seeing Lydia decked out for their date had indeed taken Bruce back to their high school prom days, but not because she looked like a teenager. No, the person in his arms now as they swayed to the music was all woman. As the love song neared its end, he leaned back far enough to look into her luminous eyes. She stared boldly back at him and if he didn't miss his guess, Lydia felt the same attraction he did. He'd never wanted to kiss someone so badly in his entire life. He held back for her sake. 
When the time came for him to formally propose, he didn't want her to wonder if carnal desire fueled that all-important question instead of love. Besides, his mom was staring daggers. He didn't need to see it to know the truth of it. He could feel her staring. She'd been doing it all night. Bruce had done his best to steer Lydia away from her because of it. His mom wasn't the only one sending looks their way. Though, no one else seemed upset over his choice of a date, just curious. Everyone in Snow Village would know they were together by morning and he had no problem with that. Lydia sighed. I've enjoyed this date way more than I thought I would. What had you been dreading about it? She glanced over her shoulder in the direction of his mom. I guess having everyone speculating over us. Are they back together or is she just a pity date? He touched her chin with the tip of his finger and she looked back at him. No one would ever think of you as the pity date. If anything, it's the other way around. If that's the only apprehension you had about coming here with me, you shouldn't have bothered worrying. Who cares what they think? It wasn't just that. What else had you worried? I thought after all the years apart things might be awkward between us, but it feels, her breath stuttered like she might be nervous. Her gaze dropped briefly down to his lips and then she bit down on hers. Like no time has passed? Yes. Her answer sounded breathless and it took his away with it. He bent closer, his lips almost touching hers before he remembered not to go there. I feel it too. From the corner of his eyes, he saw his mother coming toward them. He took Lydia by the hand and led her from the dance floor. So maybe they were walking faster than usual, but who would notice? Without opening her eyes, Lydia fumbled around on the nightstand until she found her phone. Hello. When were you going to tell me about this wedding date? Lydia sat straight up, eyes wide open now. How had she found out about that? Mary wasn't supposed to know about this marriage scheme she'd agreed to, let alone that she and Bruce had set a tentative date already. Last night had gone really well. They had sat in his borrowed car with the heat blowing until one this morning, talking about their future and how it could all play out. Could. At the time it had seemed romantic, but in the harsh light of day with her sister on the phone demanding answers, their plans now sounded downright silly. Uh, how did you find out? Fallon Taylor said she saw you there with Bruce. So was this just a one-time thing because he needed a date to his brother's wedding, or are you two back together now? Fallon said the two of you looked like you were really into each other. Lydia deflated like a balloon with the air gone out. Mary referred to the fact that she had been Bruce's date to a wedding, not as in they had set a wedding date. The tension she'd just released started to build itself back up again. She was going to have to tell her sister. Are you sitting down? Yes. Are you comfortable? What's going on, Lydia? You're starting to worry me. Nothing to worry about. Bruce, um, we're dating. Seriously dating. In the hopes of, Lydia squeezed her eyes closed. She was messing up royally. Bruce asked me to marry him. He wants to do it by the end of the year. December 26th, in fact. I don't understand. Is this a joke? Maybe I should start at the beginning. Maybe you should. So she did, starting with his unexpected visit and ending with the discussion they'd had after the wedding. Mary, when he held me on that dance floor last night, it was like no time had passed, like we'd never broken up. Except he hadn't kissed her, not even when they said goodnight. She remembered his words from the night before. I know you don't kiss until the third date, so I'll wait until then. Just know, I really want to kiss you right now. And she would have let him. Because she had never wanted anything more in that moment. Nothing but silence greeted her from Mary's side. Lydia looked at the screen. Yep, still connected. Aren't you going to say anything? So just like that, he shows up at your place, pretending like the years since he left didn't happen, like he never heard you, and you go and fall back in love and start planning a wedding? I didn't fall back in love. I... Never stopped, I know. I'm sorry. I just don't want to see you get hurt again. Trust me, I don't want that either. Less than two months to plan a wedding, though? 
it took me longer than that to find a dress. We need to go shopping. Relief lifted the corners of her mouth. The dress would be easy since she already had the style narrowed down. She'd gone shopping with the girls she'd roomed with in college right after Hannity had announced her engagement to Marco. That had been years ago, but the experience had given her definite ideas about what she wanted in a wedding dress should her day ever come. They'd visited several shops in Denver and for the fun of it, all had tried on wedding dresses. Lydia had fallen in love with the ball gown style. And she remembered one shop being particularly accommodating. She would start her search there. I know, just the place. Are you free tomorrow? If he closed his eyes, Bruce could still feel Lydia in his arms as they danced at the wedding Saturday night. Dancing, laughing with, Holding Lydia that night had filled him with so much hope for what the future held for them it had given him the courage to suggest they set a date. And blessings of all blessings, she said yes. Judging by that smile on your face, you must have had a good weekend. Bruce's head came up with a jerk from where he'd been staring at his computer screen. His friend, Hayden, leaned against the door frame of his office. How long had he been standing there observing what must have been one sappy look on Bruce's face without being noticed? He'd met Hayden Powell in college and followed him here to Jewel Valley Baptist. The man had been instrumental in Bruce landing the youth pastor's position. He was also the one to advise Bruce as to what qualifications the committee was looking for in deciding who would be the church's new pastor. My weekend was great. How are things here? Business as usual. Hayden sat down across from Bruce. He picked up a rubber ball from the desk and started tossing it in the air. So, how did you do officiating your first wedding? Get any ideas of having one of your own? The heat in the room seemed to rise by at least 10 degrees. Of all the questions to ask, how had that one been the first to come out of his friend's mouth? Bruce debated about how much to reveal and when. Actually, I got back together with my ex, so I guess you could say it influenced me a little. His words came out stilted. Would Hayden see right through him? Even though he'd told Lydia he'd come up with the plan solely because of the upcoming job, that wasn't his only motivation. The ball stilled in Hayden's hand as he stared across at Bruce. You got back together with Dana? But I just saw her. No Bruce held up his hand and shook his head to stop Hayden from going further. He didn't need to know what Dana was up to. She'd been making a spectacle of herself in order to get back at him ever since he broke up with her three months ago. No, I didn't mean her. I met Lydia Osborne, the girl I was seeing before college. The one you claimed to still be in love with? Bruce had revealed that his realization that he was still in love with Lydia was the real reason for breaking things off with Dana. Hayden had been skeptical then and judging by the look on his face, that hadn't changed. I am still in love with her and I'm pretty sure she feels the same way about me. She just hasn't figured it out yet, but she will. Lord, please let it be so. Well. That's good then. Hayden's voice still dripped with doubt, but he'd see. She's coming for a visit next weekend. She coming to hear you preach? Bruce was scheduled to preach before the congregation that Sunday night to help the committee decide if he was the man for the job. They'd heard him preach before when he'd filled in on a Wednesday night service once when preacher Neil had been out with the flu, but that was different. The youth had been the focus that night. This time he would be aiming for the adults. In particular, the ones on the committee. His palms began to sweat just thinking about it. She'll have to leave before then. Lydia has to be at work before daybreak on Monday. Where is she staying? Bruce studied his friend's face, wondering why he wanted to know. I was going to book her a room at a hotel, but it turns out one of her college roommates lives over in Laurel Cove. She plans to stay there. Good. That's better than a hotel. Make sure everyone knows she's staying with a friend. I don't follow. Why does that matter? Hayden leaned forward. Bruce, you have to appear above reproach. All the time, but especially right now. You wouldn't want anyone speculating about late night visits, if you know what I mean. Heath seared his jaw. If it had been anyone else, the implication would have him wanting to lunge across the desk for the guy's face with his fist, but Bruce knew Hayden was only looking out for his best interest. His cell vibrated against the glass top of his desk. Bruce picked it up, glad for the break in this particular conversation. 
It's my brother, Mark. I should probably take this. I'll let you get to it then. Hayden stood but turned back before he got to the door. Congratulations on getting the girl. I hope it works out. I really mean that. Thanks. As he punched his finger against the screen to answer the call, Bruce stood to shut the door behind Hayden. Hello. I booked the suite for you. It isn't the honeymoon suite, but it's a nice one. Bruce had asked his brother to book a room for two nights right after Christmas at the ski resort where Mark worked. He and Lydia had discussed marrying the day after Christmas. They would wait until summer for the honeymoon. By that time, he should be established in his new job. But he wanted to have at least two days for the two of them before they flew back to North Carolina. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. You haven't told Mom, have you? Are you kidding me? I don't want to be anywhere near her when you reveal this crazy scheme of yours. I still think you're moving too fast. I also think you should have told Mom before you left. He'd meant to, but his mom had gone ballistic with him just telling her that he and Lydia were dating again. He'd managed to steer clear of her throughout the wedding so Lydia hopefully wouldn't notice the contemptuous looks his mom kept sending their way. I'm coming home for Thanksgiving. I'll tell her then. Thanks, bro way to ruin the holidays. Bruce massaged his brow with his fingertips. I don't understand why this is such a big deal. Why is me dating Lydia a problem for her? No idea. If it's any consolation, the rest of us love Lydia. I always thought you two would end up together, just not like this. His phone vibrated in his hand. He pulled it away long enough to glance at the screen before going back to Mark. That's mom calling now. I have to go, but thanks for booking the room. No problem. He switched over to the next call. Hi, mom. What's this I hear about you and that girl planning a slipshod wedding? Is she pregnant? Bruce stood so fast his chair careened into the wall behind him. He shot a look toward his office door. All he needed now was for someone to come check on him and end up being privy to this conversation. No, she is most definitely not pregnant, and who told you we were planning a wedding? I'm your mother. I always find out when one of my boys is up to no good. You should know that by now. So, is it true? He tried to steady his breathing. Yes and no. What kind of answer is that? Did you book a suite at the Snowscape Ski Resort for your honeymoon, or not? I'm going to kill Mark, he thought. He pulled up the messenger app on his laptop and typed in a scathing message to his brother. I haven't proposed yet. Not officially, anyway, but he'd keep that thought to himself. But we have talked about getting married right after Christmas. I booked the room just in case. Why are you doing this? Why like this, all sneaky and in a hurry? You two just started dating again, or did you lie about that too? I never lied to you. I was going to tell you, but you don't make it easy. What is that supposed to mean? You know you can tell me anything. The on the verge of tears sound of her voice caused his throat to tighten. He never wanted this decision to come between him and his mom, but... His computer made a noise and Mark's reply popped up at the bottom of the screen. It wasn't me. Don't be mad, but my wife thought mom should know. Sorry. He closed the laptop. He'd deal with Mark later. He definitely wouldn't be sharing any more secrets with him or his loose-lipped wife again. Bruce blew out a breath. Mom, you've made it perfectly clear that you don't like Lydia, but you've never said why. There was a long silence before she spoke. I have nothing against Lydia. I'm sure she is a sweet girl. I just don't think she's right for you. If you do marry her, does that mean you'll move back home where you belong? Would that change how you feel about her? A heavy sigh sounded through the phone. I think you deserve better. Better than Lydia? That was the part he really didn't understand. Lydia was a good Christian woman. She played the piano in church, always helped out any time help was needed, and she'd never been in trouble or done anything to step away from the very values his mother claimed to hold dear. She'd make a perfect preacher's wife, and he loved her. Lydia was everything a mother should want for her son, yet she didn't approve. It made no sense. I mean no disrespect, but mom, if you want to be included in my plans, it was his turn to sigh. If I get my wish, 
Lydia is going to be my wife. If you continue to speak out against her, it will only drive the wedge deeper between you and me. Is this a threat? No. Not a threat. It's just a fact. One that I don't like, but there doesn't seem to be anything I can do about it. You are the one in control of this. It's really up to you. Silence greeted him once again. Are you still there? I'm here. I just can't believe what I'm hearing. I... I need to get back to work. He was disappointed, but what else could he do? Love you, Mom. Love you too. Text between Lydia and her friends. Lydia just got off the phone with Kate. I'll be staying with her next weekend when I go to North Carolina to see Bruce. I wish we were all going to be there. I miss you guys so much. Anna, I'm jealous. Layla, Kate, be sure to put the fear of God in him. Better yet, FaceTime me in and I'll do it. Hannity, I wish I could get away. These wedding plans are killing me. Kate, I can't wait to see you, Lydia. Just wish we had more time. Ruth and wish I could be there too. I'm so ready for a trip to the States. And would love to see all of you. But you know that isn't possible. Take lots of pics to send my way. Lydia looked out the window as the airplane descended for a landing. North Carolina was so flat. Not a mountain in sight. Even in the level sections of Colorado, the mountains were always in view. The abundance of trees dressed in russet, orange, and red were interspersed with patches of green, a striking difference from the desert-like terrain she was used to. Bruce was picking her up in Charlotte and driving her to his home in Jewel Valley. How far would they have to drive to see his beloved blue-tinged mountains? She had never pictured living anywhere other than Colorado. She'd have to adjust her thinking if this was going to work. As the plane's wheels touched down, her stomach did a little flop. She would be seeing Bruce again in mere minutes. Would their greeting be of the awkward schoolgirl variety, or would they pick back up where they left off when they'd parted ways two weeks ago, like two people who'd never been apart? Well, almost. She understood why he hadn't kissed her after their date, but the anticipation was going to be the death of her. Nervous excitement built as she donned her coat and opened the overhead compartment to retrieve her carry-on. Here, let me get that for you. A tall man leaned in way too close to reach for her bag and hand it down to her. Uh, thanks. No problem. He fell in behind her as they left the plane. So, how long will you be in Charlotte? She thought, man, I don't know you. Still, she didn't want to be rude. Not long. I'm just passing through. Too bad. I was hoping maybe you'd like to grab a drink or something while you're here. My name is Isaac, by the way. Isaac Schaefer. Her feet still moving forward, she looked over her shoulder at his proffered hand and then up into his blue eyes. Was just knowing his name supposed to be enough to entice her to grab a drink with this stranger? I'm, uh, meeting my... Lydia. She whipped around at the sound of Bruce calling her name and the next minute she was in his arms. I've missed you so much. His whispered breath next to her ear sent delightful shivers racing through her body. I've missed you too. He took her by the hand after relieving her of the carry-on and they headed for the exit. So, should I be worried about that guy you were talking to? Who, Isaac? He was just asking me out for a drink. That's all. His head jerked around in her direction and she gave him a cheeky grin. She leaned in closer. You have nothing to worry about from a man I just met. You should know me better than that. What about someone you've known, say in the past ten years? Did you have any serious relationships during that time? She wanted to say yes. Not to make him jealous or anything equally childish, but because of how pathetic it was that she hadn't been in a serious relationship since high school. Then again, feeling that way probably was equally childish. No. There's been no one. What about you? There was one that some people might consider a serious relationship, but it was never going anywhere. I knew she wasn't the one I was meant to be with. I've always known that person was you. 
Yet you waited a decade to come get me, she thought. Why? She wouldn't ask. Not right now, anyway. The feeling that she wouldn't like the answer had already put a damper on her mood. Not a good way to start their weekend together. Lydia pulled the zipper up on her puffer coat and braced herself to step outside. Warmth enveloped her, stopping her in her tracks. Her face automatically lifted to the sky and she could actually feel the sun radiating heat against her skin. It was still mid-November, wasn't it? She hadn't traveled through time back to summer, had she? Bruce's chuckle sounded from beside her. In case you haven't noticed, you're not in Colorado anymore. Welcome to North Carolina. I hope you packed a jacket, because you won't need that heavy coat for at least another month here. I didn't even think to look at the weather forecast for this area. I just assumed it was winter here too. The ground was covered in snow when I left this afternoon. They started walking again. It does snow here, right? In Charlotte? Maybe a couple of times a year. A little more often in Jewel Valley, but it's nothing like back home. So, no skiing. You must miss it. Bruce and his brothers had always loved the sport. Lydia could take it or leave it. We have ski slopes, though they're not as good as an Aspen. Honestly, I've been so caught up in work, I haven't missed it all that much. You really do love what you're doing, don't you? I can't imagine ever wanting to do anything else. Bruce unlocked his Yukon and placed her bag in the back seat. He pulled out a flannel-lined jean jacket and offered it to her. It isn't very fashionable, but you can use this while you're here if the coat gets to be too much. She shed the coat, laying it across the back seat and took the jacket from him. He held the passenger door open for her to get in. Lydia waited until he rounded the vehicle to take a big whiff of the jacket. She used to love wrapping up in a shirt or jacket of his before when they were dating. She'd kept one of his flannel shirts when he broke up with her. It had soaked up many of her tears for weeks following. A secret corner of her heart wondered if she was headed for another heartache with this man. The scenic view during the two-hour trip was magnificent. The multitude of colorful trees, the grass, the simple dwellings, it was all different from what she was used to. They passed a centuries-old white, clabbered church that looked like something from a postcard. Lydia was already in love with this place. About an hour into their drive, Bruce slowed the car and pointed through the windshield. There it is. Your first look at the Blue Ridge Mountains. An uneven line of smoky blue mountains rose up just above the horizon. The mountains were only a slightly darker shade of blue than the evening sky. She probably would have missed them if he hadn't pointed it out. A strange peacefulness swept over her just looking at them. It was late by the time they made it to Kate's house. An outside light revealed a quaint country front porch scene, complete with rocking chairs. The brown cottage sported a teal door with a fall wreath that had to be one of Kate's creations. The woman was so talented when it came to stuff like that. Before Lydia could knock, her friend opened the door, emitted an ear-piercing squeal, and locked her in a hug. It's so good to see you again. We really need to do this more often. You'll probably be seeing me a lot more often from now on. Kate studied her for a second before turning to Bruce and offering her hand. Hi. I'm Kate, but I'm sure you already know that. You must be Bruce. He shook her hand and nodded. Nice to meet you, Kate. Well, y'all come on in. It's late and I know you ladies have a lot of catching up to do, so I'm going to head toward home. Lydia, I'll see you in the morning. After one little disappointing kiss on her cheek, he was gone. Kate grasped Lydia's forearm and leaned closer. He's cute. A breathy laugh escaped her lips. Well, you know I've always thought so too. So, is this a casual Gitri acquainted visit, or, Kate bit her lip, eyebrows raised as she looked to Lydia for an answer to a question she didn't really ask. Lydia held her thumb and forefinger an inch apart. It's a tiny bit more serious than that. Figured. Let's go inside where it's warm and you can tell me what's going on. Kate held the door and motioned for her to enter. 
The little cottage was just as country cozy on the inside as on the outside. Besides the warm glow of a fire that crackled in the stone fireplace, a lamp arching over an old armchair provided the only lighting. A few tastefully placed modern touches struck the perfect balance of charm and style. Quintessential Kate was the term used among their friends. Lydia sank into the overstuffed sofa and Kate took the armchair. Instead of getting comfortable, Kate leaned over the arm of the chair toward Lydia. Okay, spill. What's going on between you and the cute preacher boy? Lydia took a deep breath before answering. Nothing was official. What if they decided not to get married and she ended up looking like a fool? Then again, Bruce had already booked them a honeymoon of sorts. Her face heated the same as it had when he'd first told her. It isn't official yet, but the plan right now is for us to get married the day after Christmas. Kate's mouth gaped open. What? You just started seeing each other again? Or were you keeping that from us too? By us, she meant the girls, her college roommates. No, this really did start a couple of weeks ago, just like I said. Please don't tell the girls until I do. I'll send a message out tonight. I promise. I won't. So tell me how this whole thing started. Did he just show up at your place on bended knee and propose? Not exactly. Kate propped an elbow on the arm of her chair with her palm beneath her chin. Tell me everything, leave nothing out. Lydia started from the beginning and explained Bruce's reasons for getting married by the end of the year. She knew the question that would follow. What's in it for you? And Kate didn't disappoint. Lydia could have told her all about how her biological clock was ticking away like a time bomb, how she wanted the security of a husband, a family of her own, but there really was only one reason. I'm in love with him. Always have been. She shrugged, knowing the explanation was overly simple. If he decides to go through with it, I will be getting married come December 26. Kate reached over and squeezed Lydia's hand. What kind of wedding do you want? I'm honestly so busy, I can't even plan my own, but I can probably give you a few pointers. Lydia released the breath she'd been holding with a laugh. Nothing like having friends you could count on. Kate didn't tell her she was crazy. She didn't even try to talk her out of it. In true Kate fashion, she whipped out her ever-present notebook and made a list. Bruce massaged his forehead as he witnessed the disaster going on in the fellowship hall. He never should have put Casey Porter in charge of the teens. They volunteered to make a variety of cakes for the community's Harvest of Blessings organization. For goodness sake, they were using box cake mixes and every one of them knew how to follow instructions. Casey was only supposed to supervise. If she had been watching instead of trying to do everything for them, she would have noticed that no one thought to prepare the cake pans. No, he should have been here doing his job instead of taking Lydia out to brunch and a tour of the town. He wanted this weekend to be a time for just the two of them since the next time they saw each other, they would be spending time with family for Thanksgiving. He would also wanted her to love Jewel Valley as much as he did, to picture it as her future home. So none of the cakes released from the pans, right? Casey shook her head. I was busy doing all the mixing. All they had to do was pour it into the pans. I thought they could at least do that part on their own. The baking spray was sitting right there. She jabbed her finger at the aerosol can on the counter like it was the real offender in this situation. Casey probably wasn't trying to make the kids out to be idiots, but judging by the dejected looks, that's exactly how they felt. No worries. I'll just run to the store for more cake mixes and we'll start over. Groans sounded around the kitchen. Bruce wanted to join in, but he had to be the example here. He looked at Lydia with an apology on his lips and was met with a confusing, hope-filled smile. I can fix this. He looked back at the ruined cakes. How? Do you have some magic up your sleeve that will glue all these pieces back together? No. I mean we can turn this into something else. Truffles may not be what you had planned, but it will be a dessert, and it will save us from having to start over. All we need is some chocolate and maybe some sprinkles. If we were near my shop, we could get it done in a few minutes. She tapped her finger against her bottom lip as she stared at the ruined cakes. I guess, in a pinch, 
We could use some fast-melting, dipping chocolate. She held her hands about a foot apart. They sell them in big blocks at the grocery store. It won't be the same as what I usually use, but they'd still taste pretty good. I think I saw a couple of those in the pantry. Hold on a sec. Teenagers parted like the Red Sea, forming a pathway to the pantry. In no time, he found what they needed. He stepped back into the kitchen to find Lydia tying on an apron while the kids gleefully crumbled the cakes. In less than a minute, she'd made everything better. He could easily picture them working in tandem for the rest of their lives and was kicking himself once again for not begging her to take him back as soon as college ended. Bruce held the chocolate out to her. I found these two, but one of them is white. Will that work? Lydia bit her lip. Perfect, but we may need a couple more. This is a lot of cake. Any sprinkles? No, but I'll pick some up. I'll go. Casey looked more than a little eager to flee the scene. Just tell me what you need, and I'll get it. That way you can spend more time with your girlfriend. Catcalls and laughter sounded around the room. Ignoring them, Bruce thanked Casey. Seeing Lydia surrounded by the teens he had come to love with the look of pure joy on her face made it easy to forgive Casey for her part in the cake disaster and himself for not being here to begin with. What do we do next, Miss Lydia? Lydia sent a questioning look, one he couldn't read, his way before answering. Find the icing that goes with each cake and mix it in. It'll work like mortar to cement it all together so we can form the mixture into little balls. Then once we get the chocolate melted, we'll dip the balls and add sprinkles. Bruce spoke to the room at large, but he couldn't take his eyes off Lydia. Miss Lydia's an expert when it comes to candy. She works in a chocolate shop in Colorado. If the teens weren't fans before, they were now. They bombarded her with questions, then started debating the best candy bars among themselves. Lydia leaned closer to him and lowered her voice. Why does everyone keep calling me Miss Lydia? It's another one of those southern things. It's a sign of respect to elders. Gee, thanks for calling me old. Well, you are older than I am. She rolled her eyes. Yeah, by two whole months. At least this southern thing isn't as bad as that tea last night. Lydia shivered and Bruce laughed. He hadn't thought to warn her that she needed to specify that she wanted unsweet tea. Her look with the first swallow had been comical. They had the cake mixture rolled into balls and the first batch of chocolate melting when Casey swooped in with her purchases and made her excuses before fleeing like the building was on fire. Bruce doubted very seriously that she would volunteer to help with the teens again. How do we know these are any good? I think we should eat some and find out. Obi Tucker, one of the always hungry 13-year-olds, plied his charms on Lydia with a grin. Lydia smiled back at him. A good cook always tests before serving. Why don't we wait until they're all done and we'll each pick one? Looking in on the interaction between the kids with the woman he planned to spend his life with, Bruce was once again filled with assuredness that Lydia was the one. Thankfully, he'd figured it out before things had gone too far with Dana. Who's getting married? Obi held up a piece of paper and looked back and forth between Bruce and Lydia. Are you two engaged or something? What is that? Bruce reached for the paper. Let me see it. Obi handed it over and raised his hands. Hey, I just found it lying on the floor. I bet you did. The boy had been known to snoop through personal belongings before. Wedding essentials was written at the top of the page followed by a list. Bruce didn't recognize the handwriting of the list maker, but that was definitely Lydia's small scribble in the notes out to the side. That's just a list my friend gave me. She's a wedding planner. Lydia made the announcement with a shrug, no doubt hoping to throw suspicion by accrediting her friend with the list, but judging by the knowing looks of some of the teenage girls, it hadn't worked. She held her hand out, but he didn't relinquish the list. He smirked down at her instead and whispered, why is there a big check mark by this first item on the list? Did you already buy a dress? One perfectly shaped eyebrow quirked upward. Do you really want to have this discussion right now? He glanced over her shoulder and saw that they had captured the attention of the entire room. He'd never seen his teen so quiet or attentive. Rumors would fly after this. Maybe he would add truth to those reports before the day was through. I'll hold on to this for you and we can go over it later then. With a grin, 
he refolded the paper and slid it into his back pocket. A tea drinker's paradise. This was unlike any tea room Lydia had ever visited before. Bruce had seemed almost giddy over introducing her to the Chai Mahal, and now she understood why. Instead of the usual dainty, pastel decor you'd expect to see in a tea room, this one popped with a variety of vivid colors. The food was fantastic, and the tea. Oh, the tea. She could drink their signature mix every day for the rest of her life and never tire of it. After enjoying a heartier meal than expected for a tea room, they now lingered over a sample tray of mini desserts and more tea. Lydia smiled at Bruce and shook her head. This day was so. Not what you expected. His lips pressed into a thin line. I'm sorry we didn't get to do more sightseeing like we'd planned. We'll definitely do that the next visit. She laid her hand on his. I was going to say something like, this day has been exciting, better than expected, actually. Confusion wrinkled his brow. But we mostly just hung out with the youth. The only thing we got to do of what I had planned was that brief visit to my house, which I'm sure was a disappointment to you. It's a real downgrade from your place. The visit had indeed been brief, and a little strange with his friend from church tagging along. Bruce had said it was to protect them from gossip, but it felt archaic, like back when a chaperone had to be present every time a guy and a girl shared the same space. I liked your place. It has a lot of potential. Would it be too forward of her to say that she could already picture herself living there with him? Sure, the interior looked like a bachelor's, but once she incorporated her belongings, that would no longer be the case. The house was bigger than the one she shared with Tawny, and with a prettier, woodland setting. She could easily picture raising a family there one day. As for hanging out with your youth group, I've never done anything like that before. I had more fun than I thought I would. The church here is a lot different than back home. I had wondered how you would take to it, but you handled it like a pro, coming in and saving the day. As far as Lydia knew, there had never been a youth group meeting at Community Church in Snow Village. Unless there was a death or marriage, the church held exactly two services per week. Mass was held every Saturday night for the Catholics in the community and everyone else met on Sunday morning. And, it was the only church in Snow Village. One of the first things she noticed coming through North Carolina was the astounding number of churches. And not just different denominations either. She'd counted three Baptist churches in one of the small towns they'd passed through. Hearing Bruce talk about the way things were run at his church had seemed a little daunting. The fact that they had a pastor just for the youth went beyond Lydia's imagination. Whether or not she would make a good pastor's wife remained one of her lingering doubts, but spending time with the teens had come naturally. She found herself looking forward to doing it again. I guess now would be a good time to go over your list. List? He pulled a folded sheet of notebook paper from his back pocket, unfolded it, and smoothed it flat on the table between them. Oh, that list. Lydia's face heated. So, you already have a dress? He studied her, like, like, well, she didn't know what that look meant. Was he upset that she had bought a wedding dress before an official engagement? I, uh. She placed her hand over her neck, trying to cool the inferno radiating from her skin. You see, one of my friends from college got engaged a while back. A group of us went for her first dress fitting and we all tried on dresses just for fun. So you found a dress you liked and bought it. He nodded and his smile dimmed a little. What did that mean? Probably nothing, but Lydia couldn't help analyzing every nuance of his expressions, wondering what he'd think when he found out the truth. That she'd hightailed it back to that shop as soon as he made a mere suggestion of a marriage between them. She could just leave it as is. But she didn't want any lies between them. That's not exactly how it happened. I did find a dress that day that I loved. One that made me dream again that there could be a wedding in my future regardless of how bleak my prospects seemed at the time. She pinched her eyes, closed, and plowed through her confession. I bought the dress last Monday. I know there's a possibility that you could change your mind about marrying me, but I thought just in case. 
I really loved that dress and figured it couldn't hurt to go ahead and get it. She left out the part where she and Mary turned it into an all-day shopping trip because her wardrobe was seriously lacking. And if she was going to date and then marry a preacher, that had to change. Had he even noticed the fact that her clothes now fit like they were supposed to? Probably not. The only thing he'd seen her in that hadn't was that ratty old sweatshirt she'd had on the first time he showed up at her place. She'd trashed that outfit the very next morning. He brought her hand up to his lips and kissed the back of it. I won't change my mind, and I'm glad you were excited enough to go ahead and get the dress. She exhaled the tension that had shown up the minute he mentioned that list, the one that made her look too anxious for a wedding when nothing short of the assurance of his love would make her go through with it. Probably. I'm going to rent a tux. What? Bruce pointed to the list. It says here either a suit or tux for the groom, depending on the type of wedding you choose. You wrote simple, but elegant, beside that, so I'm thinking tux. As for the ring, I just want a plain white gold band. What about you? S. Same. They were actually planning their wedding now? Sure, she had been planning it in her head since he first brought up the idea and Kate had solidified it with this list, but Bruce talked as if it were a done deal. Like the decision was sealed. Beside photographer, your friend wrote use hashtag. What does that mean? People usually snap pictures with their phones. If we provide them with a hashtag, we'll be able to see all of their photos in one place. A photographer can't be everywhere at once. Besides, it may be hard to find one on such short notice. Lydia took a sip of tea to wet her suddenly parched throat. Bruce nodded. My cousin is a DJ. I can probably get him for the reception. Do you really want to have the reception at the community center? Well, um, it may be the only thing available. Plus, it'll still be decorated for Christmas, so that would save us from having to come up with stuff. Do you have a better idea? I would say the lounge at the ski resort, but I already know it's booked for that day. He drummed his fingers against the tabletop as he stared down at the list. Was he finally having some reservations about this quick wedding? We don't have to worry about the cake. My mom will take care of that. Your mom? Are you sure? She gave her heart a mental pep talk, telling it to slow down. I mean, does she even know about this? His mom owned a bakery that specialized in wedding cakes. She would be the obvious choice if not for the fact that she hated Lydia. The evil look she'd sent Lydia's way at Jason and Irina's wedding were enough to make her rethink this whole marriage thing. The only consoling factor was that once married, half the United States would separate her from her mother-in-law. Bruce studied her face with the beginnings of a smile. Could he read her thoughts about his mother? Mom knows about it. She was upset that we're moving so fast, but don't worry. I'm sure she'll come around. He reached for her hand, intertwining his fingers with hers, and the grin finally broke through. And if she doesn't, you can console yourself by the fact that you'll be here with me, and she'll still be in Colorado. So he had been able to read her mind. He always could. They'd always been like two halves of a whole, which had made it all the more confusing when he chose to break it off. Lydia pushed the thought away again. It had taken a while, but apparently he had finally figured out that they were meant to be together. I think we should go ahead and announce our engagement. What? Good thing she was sitting down. The sensation was like missing a step and thinking you're about to fall. How did they jump from talking about doing this thing to calling themselves engaged? His thumb rubbed against the back of her hand. I mean, I know there's a chance you could decide at the last minute that you don't want to marry me, but just in case you choose to make me the happiest of men by meeting me at the altar the day after Christmas and saying I do, I want it to be just what you have planned, simple, but elegant with our friends and family there to witness our vows. That won't happen if we don't give them some kind of warning. Lydia placed a hand over her quaking stomach and blew out a shaky breath. Her family and friends already knew. It was only fair that Bruce make the announcement since he had more people to tell. What did you have in mind? Social media or did you want to send out formal invitations? Social media works. She nodded. 
I'll be back in a minute. Lydia pointed toward the restroom as words seemed to be beyond her reach at the moment. She entered the ladies' room on shaky legs, leaned with her palms against the edge of the sink, and stared at her reflection. Everything will be all right. Calm down. Breathe. She was overreacting. Bruce planning the details of their marriage was no different than her buying that dress. And him making the announcement on social media was no different than her texting her friends with the news. Feeling loads better, Lydia walked back to the table. Bruce stood upon her arrival and took her by the hand. She gasped as he went down on one knee and held up a diamond engagement ring in front of her. Lydia Francesca Osborne, I will consider myself blessed beyond measure if you would consent to be my wife. Her eyes focused on the intricate filigree design surrounding the three princess-cut diamonds, a large one in the middle that was at least a carat, if not more, with two smaller stones on each side. The setting represented past, present, and future. The design alone was proof of their past together. It looked so much like her mother's, now adorning Mary's hand. Lydia had shown it to Bruce once. She couldn't believe he remembered. She looked into his hazel eyes and saw only love there, but was it the type worth building a future on? Did she love him enough? In this present moment, her heart screamed yes. That last word whispered through her lips as if of its own accord. Bruce laughed breathlessly as he slipped the cool metal ring onto her finger. In the next moment, he had her in his arms, swinging her around before pressing a simple kiss to her lips, their first since they'd gotten back together. She'd been waiting for him to kiss her ever since his brother's wedding, and it was over in a blink. The room broke out in applause. A waiter congratulated them as he handed Bruce his phone back. The whole thing had been videoed and would soon be uploaded to the internet where it would be held for all eternity as either a precious memory she would treasure forever, or perpetual proof of the worst decision of her life. Only time would tell. Text between Lydia and her friends. Layla, girl. You're engaged? Kate, I love that he got someone to video it. The look on your face was priceless. Hannity, congrats. Ruth and, I'm so happy for you. Anna, yay. Monday morning found Bruce secluded in his office, eyes glued to his laptop as he watched the video of himself behind the pulpit from the night before. He cringed when he heard himself stumbling over a word for the second time during his sermon. In his heart, he knew he was being overly critical. According to Hayden, the committee had been impressed, but was it enough? Muffled voices sounded from outside his door and he muted his laptop. He didn't want to get caught watching himself preach. He wasn't conceited, just anxious. Bruce cocked his head and looked toward the door. It sounded like someone was crying. Had something happened that would affect one of his kids? His feet automatically carried him toward the door just as someone tapped. As soon as Bruce opened the door, Dana threw herself into his arms. What in the world had happened to cause his ex-girlfriend to seek him out? He looked at the church secretary, hoping for some insight, but Pat only pursed her lips and shook her head before heading back in the direction of her office. Bruce awkwardly patted Dana's back. What's going on? Without releasing the death grip she had on him, Dana leaned back enough to look at him with those watery blue eyes. You're making the biggest mistake of your life. I had to stop you before it's too late. Gripping her shoulders, he pried her away from his body. What are you talking about? Bruce, you can't marry that girl. Of all the reactions he'd expected when he uploaded the engagement video this morning, this wasn't one of them. Dana had barely spoken to him during the three months since he broke things off with her. He took a breath to reply to that effect when she cut in with a whimpered response. It's not right. It was supposed to be me. Bruce gathered his thoughts. Dana, I'm sorry you're taking my engagement to Lydia so hard. Neither one of us ever mentioned marriage while we were dating. You found a new boyfriend within a week of us breaking up, so I'm pretty sure you never thought I was the one for you. She pulled a wad of tissues from the pocket of her jacket and used it to dab at her eyes and nose. I only dated Reed to make you jealous. Should have known it wouldn't work. That was something he never appreciated or understood. When they were together, she had wasted a lot of time and effort trying to make him jealous. Irritation tainted his breath, but he held back a response. 
her brow wrinkled as she studied his features. You never did love me, did you? Dana, he took a deep breath, searching his mind for the right answer. I did care for you. I didn't mean to hurt you, and again, I'm sorry. But I realize you're not the one, the one God has in mind for me. The reverse must be true too. I'm not the one for you either. The glare she sent his way and him taking a step back. You were wrong about that then and you're wrong now. I told that woman as much too. Once she breaks it off and you come to your senses, give me a call. Bruce gritted his teeth. What did you do? I figured she had no idea what she was getting into and deserved to know the truth. His skin went hot and then cold. His first instinct was to remove Dana from his doorway so he could close himself in his office and call Lydia for damage control. He counted to ten and remembered who he was trying to be, a pastor and representative of the Lord. Dana was part of this congregation, so he couldn't avoid her. This situation needed to be dealt with delicately but firmly. I love Lydia. Always have. Even if she breaks up with me over this, even if I end up being the one to break it off, you and I will never get back together. I'm not saying that to hurt you, Dana. Hurting you was never my intention. My prayer is that you will find someone who loves you as much as you love him, but that person will never be me. I'm sorry. I really am. Her shoulders slumped. She swiped at the tears on her face and looked down the hall one direction and then the other before looking back at him. Could you do me a favor and not tell anyone about this? Her face reddened and her gaze slipped down to his chest. I wouldn't want this getting back to Reed. Are you kidding me, he thought? It was all he could do not to yell. She'd done everything in her power to ruin his future happiness, yet she wanted him to preserve hers? He could only hope Reed came to his senses before the relationship went any further, but he wouldn't say anything. Revenge wasn't right, no matter how much a person deserved it. He nodded at Dana. You have my word. She turned and walked away. He waited until she disappeared around the corner while his mind screamed at him that time was wasting. He needed to talk to Lydia now, and he could only pray she would listen. He got Lydia's voicemail, hung up and tried again. This time he left a message for her to call him as soon as possible. Her text came in a few insufferably long minutes later. I'm at work. I'll text you later. Honestly, I don't think I can handle talking to you right now anyway. His stomach tightened like he was going to be sick when he saw those words. What had Dana told her? He quickly tapped out his reply. I don't know what she told you, but it was never going to be her. You are the one for me. His phone dinged with her reply, bringing a small measure of relief. At least she was still communicating with him. Oh really? Did she know it was never going to be her? According to the message she sent me, you two dated for two years and you just suddenly broke it off without explanation. The same thing you did to me. And worse, three months later, you're engaged to me. How do you think that made her feel? How do you think it felt when you did it to me? How do I know you won't do it to me again? Lydia's hurt and anger came through loud and clear. And so had Dana's, but for different reasons. Okay, so maybe part of it was the same. No doubt, Dana had thought they might get married someday, and she had probably been hurt when he broke up with her. But the fact that she had taken up so quickly with Reed and her parting words about hoping he didn't find out, like she planned to stay with the man after declaring that she'd only started the relationship to make Bruce jealous, seemed proof enough that she hadn't been too attached. I apologize to Dana. I never meant to hurt her. It may be callous of me, but I'm more concerned with the fact that I've hurt you, back when I broke things off with you and now. Please give me a chance to talk this through with you. Face to face would be better, but I'd settle for a phone call. Please call me when you get off work. Please! Bruce tried to get back into his work, but he mostly stared at the computer screen and prayed. Sound came through the speaker of his laptop, letting him know someone was trying to reach him through video chat. A weight lifted from his chest when he saw Lydia's picture pop up. He answered and the sight of her red-rimmed eyes caused his own to sting. Dana may have been the instigator, but his own deeds had been the root cause of this. I thought you still had a while at work. I was such a mess, Orelai sent me home. The weight from his chest moved to his shoulders. Lydia, I'm so sorry. For all of it. 
Just tell me what you need to tell me. Start with why you broke up with me. Tears leaked from her eyes and she dabbed them with a tissue. I loved you and I thought you. She shook her head like she couldn't finish the sentence and dabbed away more tears. I did love you too. Still do. The truth is, I got scared. Things were moving too fast between us. I was afraid we wouldn't make it through college before marriage became inevitable. Either that, or we'd have given in to our feelings, which I think we could both agree would have been a bad thing. You should have told me. I know. I'm sorry. Why didn't you? Lydia swallowed and let out a breath as if trying to bring her tears under control. Why didn't I come back for you after graduating? She nodded. I had settled into my life in North Carolina. I figured you were over me and wouldn't want to uproot your life to move here. He ran his fingers through his hair. Look, Lydia, there were plenty of excuses, but I think now fear of rejection held me back. I mean, why would you take me back after I broke your heart? Then I started dating Dana. She was someone to hang out with. It was never serious on my part, and regardless of what she says now, I don't think it was on hers, either. So, why did you break up with her? Why did you come after me now if fear is what held you back before? I have to say, it took a lot of nerve coming here suggesting what you did. You didn't seem afraid at all. It still feels, not real. He said a short prayer that she would hear what he had to say with understanding and that it wouldn't cause more trouble. Call it a moment of clarity, if you will, but the minute Hayden mentioned that my chances would improve with marriage, it was like someone flipped a switch. I knew without a doubt that you were the one I was meant to be with and not Dana. You are the only one I have ever pictured being married to. You are the only woman I've ever loved. Still love. It's always been only you, Lydia. More tears streamed down her face, tightening the band around Bruce's heart. Then a smile broke through and he took the first easy breath since Dana showed up at his office door. Lydia leaned a little closer to the screen. You love me? Confusion wrinkled his brow. Why else would he be doing this? That ring on her finger was proof of that, right? Of course I love you. Her delicate fingers touched her lips as she laughed a little. That's the first time you've said it since we got back together. I wasn't sure. I just kept hoping it would come before the idos. I'd hate to have to leave you at the altar. What? I've said it before. Hadn't he? He tried to remember a point in time when he'd said those words. Nothing. Lydia shook her head. No, you haven't. We haven't even had a real kiss yet. He knew the peck on the lips after he proposed hadn't been anything to write home about. It hadn't seemed appropriate to have a make-out session with the camera rolling. But not telling her that he loved her? How could he have missed that all-important detail? He placed his hand over his heart, hoping to convey his sincerity through the computer screen. Then let me make myself perfectly clear. Lydia Francesca Osborne, I love you. I fell in love with you back in high school and that never went away. You're the only woman I've ever loved and the only one I ever will. Bruce leaned closer to the computer screen, wishing they were in the same place so he could demonstrate what he was about to say. And about that kiss, get those lips ready because the next time I see you, I don't care who's watching, I'm going to lay one on you so hot, it'll have your socks smoking. She choked out a laugh. You are so clueless sometimes, but I love you anyway. And I'll be wearing two pairs of socks the next time you see me, so you'll have your work cut out for you. Lydia watched through the windshield of her Subaru as the airport shuttle slowly made its trek through the parking lot. Bruce had asked her to wait for him there to keep her from having to go out in the cold, but at 3 a.m. in the dark, it was kind of creepy. It seemed an eternity since she saw him last. After the phone call from his ex, she hadn't been sure she ever wanted to see him again. Thank God that had been smoothed over, leaving her more sure than ever that he was the one she wanted to spend the rest of her life with. There had been one other moment of doubt. Last Friday, sitting in the maternity ward, waiting for her nephew to be born, she'd questioned if it was right for her to move so far away from her sister. Mary was the only family she had left. And Lydia would miss out on seeing little Sayer grow up. Unknowingly, Mary had made it all better when she'd transferred the precious baby boy into Lydia's arms and said, one day, you'll have one of your own. All doubts fled as she kissed Sayer's downy cheek. 
Sure, there were some things she might miss out on by not staying, but she loved Bruce and would be missing out on so much more without him. The shuttle stopped a few car lengths away and Bruce got off and headed her way. Letting out a relieved breath, she hit the switch to unlock the doors. He threw his bag in the back and then got in. Before she could say hello, he leaned across the console, placed his hands on both sides of her face, locked his lips with hers, and every thought in her head fluttered away. She felt her seatbelt release and he pulled her closer. Now this is more like it, she thought. His lips, cool from the early morning air, quickly warmed against hers. Lydia dug her fingers into his coat, trying to tuck him closer, but the console was in the way. She pushed her feet against the floorboard to lift herself over and accidentally hit the gas. Thankfully, the car was in park. Bruce's laughter sounded over the roar of the engine. He patted the dash. I know exactly how you feel. A grin still lighting his face, he turned to Lydia. That's probably our cue, it's time to get out of here. Then he leaned across the console and pulled her in for another kiss this time a slow and tender one that puddled her insides like melted chocolate. He pulled back, his hand still cupping the side of her face as he peered into her eyes. I just want to say it again in person. I love you, and I'm sorry for all the hurt I've caused you. Before she could respond, he kissed her again. At this rate, they'd never make it to his mom's house, which was fine with Lydia. When he pulled away this time, she was quick to tell him she loved him too. As far as she was concerned, December 26 couldn't come fast enough. They stopped at an all-night diner on the way from Denver to Snow Village. Over pancakes, Bruce caught her up on his youth group's progress in preparing for the Christmas program. His enthusiasm was contagious. Lydia found herself longing for the types of activities and interactions he shared not only with the youth but also with the rest of the congregation. His church life, compared to hers, was like the difference between a full dessert bar versus a single piece of candy. Lydia pushed her breakfast plate aside and pulled out a notepad. She flipped to the back where she'd made a list for the wedding to replace the one Bruce had kept. I talked to someone at the community center. It's free for the 26th, so I booked it. It will still be decorated for Christmas, but we'll have to set the tables up and decorate them ourselves. Mary is going to help me come up with the centerpieces. He drummed his fingers along the edge of the table. I'm sure my brothers can help with setup. I talked to my cousin. He's free to do the music that day. He needs a list of any special songs you'd like played. If you email me the list, I'll forward it to him. She jotted down a reminder for herself. I couldn't find a caterer, but my boss offered to supply a dessert bar for us which is very generous considering she isn't too happy with me right now. Bruce placed his hand over hers. What happened? Ora Lee hoped I would take over the business one day. She went ballistic when I told her I was getting married and put in my notice. Is that what you'd planned to do, take over the chocolate shop? I didn't really have a plan. It's like I've been going with the flow, biding my time while waiting for you to get your head on straight. Lydia couldn't help but smile. She'd had no idea that he'd ever show back up in her life, but she was happy that he had. Sorry to have kept you waiting. I'm just glad no one else married you before I figured things out. Me too. Bruce tapped the planner. Have you thought about what kind of wedding cake you want? I haven't talked to mom about it yet. I plan to bring it up after Thanksgiving. If you tell me what you have in mind, I can let her know. Unless you want to share your ideas with her yourself. She had been avoiding his mom for weeks now. Every time they made eye contact, Lydia got the feeling Mrs. Coletto was practicing Darth Vader's choke cold move. Without the hand motion, of course. Maybe that was the flaw in her technique. Regardless, she was Bruce's mother and if he wanted her to make their wedding cake, so be it. But he would have to be the one to ask. Lydia slipped her phone from her pocket and pulled up her wedding planning Pinterest board. She found one of the cake possibilities she'd pinned and flipped the phone around for Bruce to see. What about something like this? The cake part is a simple white cake with buttercream frosting. 
or a Lee could provide the melted chocolate to drizzle on top and down the sides. And I was thinking that instead of fruit, we could use candy to tie into the dessert bar. What do you think? So all mom would have to supply would be the basic cake and someone else would add the finishing touches? She bit her lip and studied Bruce's face while he studied the picture. Did he think she was trying to slide his mom? She really wasn't. With us having a wedding the day after Christmas with such a short time to plan and bring it all together, I've been trying to cut things down to the minimum so it won't be too taxing on anyone. Your mom probably already has everything on hand for the cake. The melted chocolate is nothing and the candy will already be there. He sat back in his seat and looked at her. My brother's weddings cost tens of thousands of dollars to put on. They each took a year of planning. Guests showed up in the hundreds. I've rushed you into this, and I'm starting to realize how unfair that is to you. Lydia's throat tightened and her nose stung. Bruce, are you backing out? He reached for her hand. Of course not. I'm only saying maybe we should wait to get married so you can have the wedding of your dreams. Lydia pushed back into her seat and studied him. My dream is to marry you. And I certainly don't want to spend tens of thousands of dollars on one day that will not define the rest of our lives together. The whole point of us getting married before the end of the year was to help you win the position of senior pastor. Wouldn't you be throwing away your own dreams by waiting a year? He held both hands out across the table and she placed hers in his. There are no guarantees I'll get that job. More than anything, I believe Hayden's suggestion was a push from God to remind me that we were meant to be together. I don't think the date is important. Bruce, I don't want to wait another year. I've already waited ten. I'm ready for our life together to begin. I want, she swallowed the lump in her throat and took a deep breath. I have Mary, Jace, and now Sayre. She couldn't help but smile every time she mentioned the baby's name. But I haven't felt like I've had a real family since mom and dad died. I'm ready to have a family of my own. He lifted her left hand and kissed her knuckles just below the ring he'd placed there. I'm ready to be married now. I was only thinking of you when I asked if you wanted to change the date. I'm glad you didn't take me up on it. Her shoulders dropped in relief and she gave Bruce's fingers a little squeeze. It's going to be great. You'll see. This Italian cream cake is excellent, Mrs. Coletto. Bruce studied his mom from across the table to see her reaction to Lydia's latest attempt to make nice. Without looking up, his mom dipped her head in acknowledgement. It's just like the one my mom used to bake. My sister, Mary, has attempted the recipe, but it never turns out as good. His mom did look at Lydia then. This is my family's recipe that has been perfected and passed down. Your mother's recipe may have been similar, but it couldn't possibly be the same. I'm glad you're enjoying it, though. Was your mom Italian, Lydia? Bruce didn't even hear Lydia's reply to Irina's question. His newest sister-in-law had been running interference all afternoon, and he had to wonder if she'd ever had to deal with his mother's thorny side before. They seemed to get along now, but he hadn't been around when Irina was first introduced. Would his mother ever warm up to Lydia? Mom, wait until you see the cake idea Lydia came up with for our wedding. From his periphery, Bruce saw Lydia's head whip around in his direction but he kept his eyes trained on his mother. He should have waited until they were alone to bring this up with his mom. He knew that, but something about the tension in the room had him blurting it out anyway. His mother quirked one eyebrow as she stared deadpan back at him. Oh, is she making her own cake? We thought you could make the cake part and she or someone from the chocolate shop could add the details. Mom's fork dropped with a clatter onto her plate. December is my busiest season. I'm already booked. And I never collaborate. Never. I have a reputation to uphold. Every wedding cake that leaves my shop is a signature creation. Bruce unclenched his jaw long enough for one question. You're too booked to make your own son's wedding cake? He felt Lydia's hand wrap around his fist but still couldn't unglue his gaze from his mother's face. His mom's jaw dropped and she turned her glare toward his fiancée. What had Lydia said? He mulled over the words his ears had heard but took a moment to seep through the red haze of anger circling his brain. 
Don't worry about it, Mrs. Coletto. I'm sure one from the supermarket will do just as well as one of yours. He heard a cough from his brother, Mark, that sounded suspiciously like a laugh. Lydia couldn't have insulted his mom more if she tried, and her delivery had been so sweet, as if her only thought was to keep his mother from the inconvenience of having to make one more cake. Did she have any idea what she'd done? Lydia turned her smile toward him, but the look in her dark brown eyes revealed the hurt of his mom's rejection. Bruce, I promised I'd go by Mary's and watch the baby for an hour or two so they can get some rest. I had better get going. Walk me out? That was news to him, but he wouldn't try to hold her here. Sure. He didn't look back as he left the dining room, and Lydia didn't say a goodbye to anyone sitting at the table. He couldn't blame her. It had been a tension-filled day and it would only get worse once he confronted his mom. Lydia turned to face him at the front door. You don't have to go out to the car. Stay in here where it's warm. She ran her hand down his arm then wove her fingers through his. I mainly wanted to give you a chance to walk away and cool off before things went too far. And I wanted to apologize. Apologize? What do you have to apologize for? When I said that thing about getting a cake from the supermarket, it sounded like an insult to your mother's cake-making abilities and that's not how I meant it. He chuffed out a laugh. She deserved it. Lydia stepped closer and placed her free hand on his chest. The last thing I want to do is come between you and your mother. I'd give anything if mine was still here. He pulled her into his arms and kissed her forehead. I'm sorry she isn't. I wish. He shook his head, unsure if he should go any further. To say that he wished his own mother would fill in the gap for Lydia may not come across right, and it was a moot point anyway. I wish your mother liked me, but she doesn't. I'm more sorry for your sake than my own. All I can do is promise not to antagonize her on purpose. A deep sigh moved through his chest. You didn't do anything wrong. She lifted her head to look up at him. You want to come over later? I'll see if Tony'll invite Glenn and maybe we can play cards or something. Sure, that sounds great. After Lydia left, he went in search of his mom. He found her alone in the kitchen putting the leftover food away. Perfect. He nabbed a ravioli and popped it into his mouth as he tried to think of a way to start this dreaded conversation. You always did love my pumpkin ravioli. His mom smiled brightly up at him without an ounce of the earlier tension showing. I love all of your food, Mom. It's one of the things I look forward to when I come back to Colorado. This is still your home. I guess, but it didn't feel like it today. Not with the way you were treating my future wife. Mom pushed down on the plastic lid of the bowl in front of her until it sealed with a pop you just don't understand. He faced her, leaning his back against the edge of the counter. Then explain it to me. Tell me once and for all, what do you have against Lydia? She stared down at the bowl in her hands without saying anything. Bruce let the silence stretch out until he couldn't take it any longer. She's a good, Christian girl who, as far as I know, has never disrespected you. She's never done anything to hurt your son despite the fact that I broke her heart when I ended our relationship before leaving for college. She's perfect for me. A humorless laugh escaped him. Her mom was even an Italian, just like you. That ought to count as doubling your book. Was. What? She was Italian. His mom finally looked at him, but it did nothing to clear up the meaning of her words. She lost her parents at a young age. You have no idea what that does to a person. I never wanted you to end up with someone as broken as I am. I never wanted you to have to go through what I put your father through. All the air left his lungs. That was it? His grandparents died when his mom was a child. She had been taken in by an abusive aunt and her philandering husband, and it had caused her all sorts of emotional problems. But she had received help early in her marriage to his father. The dark days had been long over for his mom, as far as Bruce knew, but apparently not forgotten. Mom, Lydia was 16 years old when her parents died. You were only eight when you lost yours. And she had her sister, who by all accounts, took good care of her. Lydia didn't have to go through what you went through. I imagine losing her parents hurt like crazy, but it didn't break her. His mom's lip began to tremble, and tears coursed over her cheeks. He pulled her into a hug. I'm sorry for what happened to you, 
but that has nothing to do with who Lydia is. Mom, I love her with all my heart, and I love you too. I can't make you like her, but please try a little harder to get along with her. For my sake, please try. Text between Lydia and her friends. Lydia, Bruce's mom, hates me with a passion. Ruth and, still? Kate, you'd think she would try a little harder. Since you're soon to be part of her family. Hannity, typical mother-in-law, I guess. Hopefully, she'll come around. Anna, so glad I don't have that problem. Praying it turns around. Layla, don't all mothers-in-law? Sorry, not a joking matter. No, I'll be praying God softens her heart. So, how does it look? Tawny's voice came through a few octaves lower than usual, probably because she was calling from work. Hold on. I'm just now unlocking the door. That is, if I can get this key to work. When Lydia found out that the community center had been decorated for Christmas, she'd asked to see it, and the mayor's secretary had handed the key right over. Lydia wondered now if it was the right one. She jiggled it around in the lock as she tried the handle. After pulling back slightly on the key, the tumble moved so she could finally unlock the door. Got it. So, how is it? Everything you dreamed it would be? Everything she dreamed it would be seemed a lofty idea indeed. She'd settle for slightly better than good enough, because that's all she was likely to get on such short notice. With the flip of a switch, light flooded the room. Her gaze traveled the perimeter. Strings of lights draped the ceiling from all around the perimeter and met in the middle. Three artificial evergreens of varying sizes sat in the far right corner. Fake snow blanketed the limbs and floor beneath. It looks nice. Or it will after I add more details. What's wrong? You don't exactly sound pleased. Nothing's wrong. I just realized I have more work ahead than I thought but, nothing I can't handle. Lydia walked to one of the round tables and sat down. Right now the tables are bare, but once I... Just then Gina Coletto stepped into the room and took the air right out of Lydia's lungs. What in the world is she doing here? She thought. Tawny, can I call you back? Bruce's mother is here. Tawny's voice squeaked through the phone, and Lydia prayed the sound didn't carry through the empty room. Were you expecting her? Um, no. Don't hang up. I'll mute it from my end. What if she has something nefarious in mind? You need a witness. As soon as Lydia set the phone down on the table without ending the call, she knew it had been the wrong thing to do. But with the combo of her rapid heartbeat, Tawny's fast talking, and Mrs. Coletto's quick approach, her moral compass may have hit a curb. It was too late to do anything about it now. May I? Mrs. Coletto indicated the seat next to her and Lydia could only nod her reply. What could the woman possibly want with her? Bruce was only a phone call away. If his mother had a question about the wedding, all she had to do was pick up the phone and call him. Unless she's going for the direct approach and wants you to call off the wedding. Lydia would never give in, but still, it would be nice not to have that conversation. Lydia, I, and Mrs. Coletto's mouth closed with a snap. Her shoulders drooped and she looked down at her folded hands. I've treated you horribly, and I need to apologize. Lydia felt her brows push against her bangs. What do I say to that? She glanced at her phone. Bruce had indicated that he'd talked to his mother and expected her to do better but he didn't exactly say what the problem was. He also hadn't said anything about her apologizing. If the woman was going to bear her soul, it shouldn't be in front of an unintended audience. Maybe if she slipped the phone into her pocket and ended the call at the same. Just as Lydia reached for the phone, Mrs. Coletto grabbed her hand and held on to it. I know I don't deserve your forgiveness, but I hope we can move forward in a better position than we began. I want to be involved in the wedding plans. Um, okay. Lydia scanned the room, trying to make her mind work. The apology had floored her, but she didn't have time to take it in. What part, exactly, did the woman want to take in the wedding? Bruce wanted you to make the cake. 
everything else is planned out already. Mrs. Coletto waved a hand in front of her. The cake is a given. I never should have denied you that to begin with. I just talked to Bruce. He told me what you had in mind. I'll make sure it's everything you dreamed of, but I want to do more. Let me pay for the wedding. Lydia shook her head. Oh, Mrs. Coletto, you do not have to do that. Besides, for the most part, it's done. Please, call me Gina. Okay. Gina. The name was foreign on her tongue, but if this was her way of bridging the rift between them, Lydia would keep saying it until it felt right. Have you paid the rental fee on this place yet? Not yet, but the check is in my purse. Good. I mean, Mrs. C, Gina, bit her lip and then reached for Lydia's hand again. Lydia hoped the stiffness in her fingers didn't show. This was a lot to get used to at once. Gina gestured to the room at large with her other hand. Is this your dream location? There was that word again. No, this wasn't her dream location, but she bristled at the unspoken implication that it didn't meet Gina Coletto's standards. Lydia slipped her hand out of the other woman's grasp. Unless you know of something better, this is the best I could come up with on such a short notice, not that I have any complaints. I just want to marry your son. Where we have the reception isn't that important. How would you feel about getting married at the ski resort? She'd love it. Because when she had allowed herself to dream, the ski resort had always been front and center in her mind. I have no objections to getting married there, but another wedding is already booked that day. Gina leaned forward, a smile lighting her face. What if I told you that wedding has been cancelled and I can get the venue, the food, and everything the other couple had ordered at a discounted price? Lydia's mouth opened and closed like a landed fish. That sounds… unbelievable. Well, believe it. It can be yours, but only if you want it. Gina leaned back in her seat and folded her hands in her lap. I don't want you to think I'm trying to take over or that I think what you have planned isn't good enough. I was coming to apologize regardless, but when I heard about this deal, it seemed like a gift. One that will hopefully make up for the way I've treated you, or at least begin to. I don't know what to say. It's simple. Would you like to get married at the resort and have your reception there? Lydia placed cool hands on each side of her heated face. She wanted to jump up and down, scream, cry, and something she never thought she'd have the desire to do, hug Bruce's mom, but a part of her wondered if the woman might rescind the offer with the least bit of enticement. After all, she'd gone from I can't stand the sight of you to you have my blessing to marry my son at breakneck speed. What was to stop her from switching back just as fast? That sounds lovely. I'd have to talk to Bruce first, of course. You do that. Gina stood and Lydia stood with her. I have an appointment in fifteen minutes. Let's meet at the ski lodge for lunch, my treat, and we can talk it over then. How does that sound? Sounds great. Lydia waited until Gina left before plopping back down in her chair with her head spinning. Who could have ever guessed that Gina Coletto would not only apologize, but also come up with a way to give her this wedding. Lydia? Are you there? Lydia jerked around at the sound of her whispered name. She snatched up her forgotten phone. Tawny, you still there? I thought for sure you would have hung up. And miss all that? Not a chance. Girl, don't you dare think about refusing that offer. You deserve it after the way she's treated you. So that really did happen? She laughed. It still doesn't seem real. But you are going to do it, aren't you? Tawny made it sound like she was giving an ultimatum. You will do this, or else. She couldn't help but grin at her sass. Lydia blew out a breath and centered her thoughts. I still need to talk to Bruce, but I already know what he'll want to do. Looks like I'll be getting married at the ski resort. You call afterwards. I can't wait to hear all the details. I will. After she hung up, Lydia said a quick prayer for the meeting to come. Even though Gina had called a truce and Lydia had accepted, it might take a while for her to feel comfortable around Bruce's mother. 
Bruce had been holding back on what could be an important bit of information for almost a week now, waiting for the right moment. Or maybe just too afraid of what Lydia would do when she heard the news, if he were being honest. Even now, when faced with the last possible moment he could get by without telling her, it still didn't seem right. Not when they sat snuggled up alone in the dark, illuminated by the light of the Christmas tree. Lydia touched the side of his face and he turned her way. What's on your mind? You seem preoccupied since you got here. Not worried about the wedding tomorrow, are you? Not in the least. He leaned in and softly kissed her lips. It's going to be a great day. I still can't believe everything you've pulled off on such short notice. I couldn't have done it without your mom's help. I'm still amazed at her complete turnaround. He tried to hold back his smirk, but it came out anyway. Yeah, she has her moments. I'm happy you two are getting along now, though. And that cake, it's beyond anything I ever imagined. The gigantic cake graduated from dark chocolate on the bottom up to white on top. Melted chocolate drizzled down the sides of each layer. Towers of chocolate topped the cake. Their guests would be buzzing from all the sugar. Lydia laid her head on his shoulder. I can't wait to dig into that cake. I think that's the part one looked forward to most. He shook with laughter. Glad to know where I stand cake first and then me? Or is there more on that list before you get to my name? She shoved against his arm. You know what I mean. Yeah. I do. So what part are you dreading the most? Dreading? Why would you ask that? Why do you get to say the part you're looking forward to most and I get stuck with the part one dread? She sat up and looked at him. Because I know you're worried about something and that's starting to worry me. Is it cold feet or what? He caressed the side of her face. Lydia, his shoulders sagged with his long exhale. I didn't get the job. What? I didn't get the senior pastor job. She wrapped her fingers around his hand. Oh, Bruce, I'm sorry. What are you going to do now? I'll continue with the job I have. I mean, I won't lie, I was upset at first. But after a lot of time spent in prayer, I have a peace now that can't be explained. You think it was God's will that you remain where you are? I do, but I've worried about how you take it. Me? Bruce, it doesn't matter what I think, not if it goes against what God wants for your life. But for the record, after seeing you with the youth, I think you are right where you're supposed to be. He blew out a breath. I'm relieved to hear that, but what about us? Her brow wrinkled. What about us? What are you asking me, Bruce? Lydia, I love you with all of my heart and want nothing more than to spend the rest of my life with you. But I don't want you to feel like I manipulated you into marrying me. When I first came to you and asked you to consider marrying me, it was under a premise fueled by my need for a wife because of this job. Now that the job is no more, he couldn't finish. If she wanted out, she'd have to be the one to say it. She huffed out a breath. Do you really think I cared about the job, other than how it affected your happiness? That my main objective in agreeing was because I was concerned you wouldn't get the job if I didn't? I said yes because being with you is all I've wanted since the first day I laid eyes on you. Wow. Way back then? I can't even remember a time when I didn't know you. Yes. It's been that long, so if you're trying to back out on marrying me now, you might have a fight on your hands. He pulled her into his arms and his lips found hers, warm and full of passion, that was his Lydia. His. Tomorrow would make that official, but knowing she had been his all along was the best thing ever. I'm not going anywhere. Not without you. Bruce hadn't seen Lydia all day and it felt like forever. Nervousness ate away at him as he waited in the gazebo with the preacher, surrounded on all sides by guests. The violinist began playing the wedding march and Bruce's heartbeat took it as a challenge. He barely restrained himself from lifting up on his toes to get a glimpse of his bride as she parted the crowd between them. And then suddenly she was there, wearing a cloud of white with a tiara crowning her dark curls, his mother's first stole around her shoulders, gazing up at him like he was everything. For a moment, nothing else existed. Just him and the woman he loved. Bruce took both of her hands in his, pulled them up to his mouth, and kissed the backs of each one. Someone spoke, but it didn't register. Then laughter sounded all around them. 
It wasn't until Lydia broke eye contact to look toward the preacher that he was able to do the same. Pastor Martinez smiled at Lydia before turning his gaze toward Bruce. Are you ready to get started now? He nodded at the same time Lydia softly said yes. Concentrating on the words being said wasn't easy. He just performed this ceremony for his brother a couple of months ago. Had Jason felt this befuddled saying his vows? The bride and groom have prepared a few words. Bruce, go ahead. Panic set in as Bruce stared at Lydia. What are the words? He'd considered reading them to her so he wouldn't mess up, but holding a sheet of notebook paper between them as he read didn't have quite the heartfelt effect as holding her hands and looking into her eyes as he said the words. Lydia, he swallowed the lump in his throat and took a deep breath. When I first mentioned marriage to you, I promised that if I wasn't madly in love with you by the time this day came, I'd call the whole thing off. Remember that? You weren't supposed to ask her that. He was supposed to say his part and she would say hers. He was screwing this whole thing up. She said yes with a smile but the look in her eyes was one of near panic. Did she think he was about to back out now? He hurried on with his speech. Well, the truth is I was already madly in love with you that day, and I promise to continue loving you forever, even on the bad days. For as long as I draw breath, I promise to faithfully stand by you, putting your needs above all others, including my own. From this day forward, my heart, my body, and my devotion belong to you alone. Thank you for agreeing to be my wife. He took a step closer and gently kissed her lips, bringing more snickers from their guests and a throat clearing from the preacher. Bruce managed not to kiss her again until the end, even when his heart felt near bursting with the love expressed with each tender word she said. When he pressed his lips to hers this time, somehow it was different. It wasn't so much the sweet softness of her mouth, the smell of her perfume, or her arms circling his neck as he held her close. It was the connection between them that held all the power. A connection that would carry them through the rest of their lives together. A beautiful glimpse of what their future held in store and he couldn't wait to get started. This wedding couldn't have been any more perfect if I'd planned it out myself. Lydia took in the rustic details of the reception hall as she slow danced with Bruce. A cream-colored material draped the tables and evergreen arrangements added a pop of color. Twinkle lights above aided by candlelight provided a romantic glow to the atmosphere. No, she couldn't have planned it better. I'm glad it turned out like it did. I worried you weren't getting the type of wedding you really wanted, and I didn't want you to regret it later. Her gaze trailed back to her husband. Her husband. A satisfying thrill ran through her every time she thought about it. As little as three months ago, the idea of marriage had only been a vague inclination. And that she would be married to the only man she'd ever loved, a pipe dream. I can't imagine I would have had regrets as long as I still got to marry you. His warm lips captured hers in a slow, smoldering kiss that had her leaning closer as she wrapped her arms around his neck. He ended the kiss and pressed his forehead to hers. There was never a doubt in my mind that you would be mine, even if we'd have had to settle for a trip to the courthouse. But this way you have a better tale to tell our daughters. She grinned and pulled back enough to look into his eyes. Our daughters? You do want children, don't you? They probably should have talked about this before they said I do, but she wasn't worried. Yes, at least a couple, but you're hoping for daughters? What's wrong with that? Not a thing. I just hope they have your dimples and that smile of yours. And I hope they look just like my beautiful wife. That earned him another kiss. She couldn't seem to help herself. She was so in love with this man and still couldn't believe he belonged to her. Finally. He pulled her closer and whispered in her ear. It's late. Ready to head upstairs? Could he feel the heat coming off her bunched cheeks? She let out a stuttered breath as she looked around at the people in the room. There were only a few couples on the dance floor and some of the tables were still occupied. Give me a few minutes to talk to the girls since it'll probably be a while before I get to see them again and then I'll be ready. Her friends weren't leaving until the morning, but since she and Bruce were taking such a short honeymoon, she wouldn't be seeing them off. He kissed her temple and pulled away. Take all the time you need. Let me know when you're ready. 
The gleam in his eyes had her blushing again. Layla stood as Lydia approached the table and leaned in for a hug. You did it up in style, girl. It turned out beautiful. Having gotten so used to seeing her in a wheelchair, Lydia had forgotten how tall her friend was. It still amazed her how God had performed such a miracle. After being wheelchair-bound for over six years, Layla was now fully healed. I'd like to take all the credit, but I have my mother-in-law to thank. I'm so glad she came through for you. The look in Layla's eyes said more than her words did. Me too. Who would have thought Gina could make such a complete turnaround? Layla sat back down and leaned into her husband as he wrapped an arm around her. They'd been married a year but seemed more mature, like they had been together for years. Hannity rubbing her pregnant belly caught Lydia's attention and brought a smile to her face. So how long before you catch up to Ruth Ann? Married right out of college, their friend Ruth Ann had wasted no time starting a family. Being six months along with baby number five had kept her from attending Lydia's wedding or Kate's, who had married two days before. Hannity rolled her eyes and blew out a breath. Oh please. I'm not that competitive. I'm happy for her, of course, but I'm thinking too for me, at the most. Her husband leaned over and kissed her cheek. Four. This brought on another eye roll. Hannity playfully smacked his chest. Her laughter drew a few gazes from around the room, and she gave Lydia a chagrined smile filled with love. Maybe you'll be next. Lydia wondered what Bruce would have to say about that. The way he just talked about them having daughters made her think he wouldn't mind. Anna motioned with her hand from across the table. Come see. Lydia walked around to look over Anna's shoulder at the tablet on the table in front of her. The close-up picture of her and Bruce tugged at her heartstrings. She was looking into the camera. His eyes were closed as he pressed a kiss to her cheek. She looked happy and she was. He looked in love. I'd love to have a copy of that. I already emailed it to you, along with all the others I took. Anna ran her finger across the screen. Instead of more pictures of her and Bruce, she flipped through one of each of their friends on their wedding day. The bride was the only one looking at the camera in each pose and all of them were wearing the same tiara. The one Lydia now wore. I'm going to have these printed out and framed as a thank you to Ruth Ann. We'll deliver it and the tiara when Mag and I visit this summer. You'll need this then. Lydia reached up and lifted the tiara from her head. She brushed her fingers over the delicate snowflake design. She'd had no idea when she'd answered the call for college roommates that she would be gaining friendships to last a lifetime. Ruth and had been the first to get married and to wear the tiara before passing it on to the next. And Lydia was last. Or maybe not. Maybe one day the next generation would want to carry on the tradition. Lydia carefully handed it to Anna. You didn't have to take it off right now. It's okay. Bruce is ready to call it a day anyway. Lydia thought she heard I bet coming from one of the guys, but didn't even try to figure out who said it. In fact, she avoided making eye contact with any of them. If she caught any knowing looks, her face might go up in flames. After a last hug and goodbye from her friends, she went in search of her husband. Bruce was speaking with one of his brothers, but he broke away and headed toward her as soon as he saw her coming. The smile he gave her sent a ripple of anticipation through her stomach that warmed her clean through. He stuck his elbow out. Are you ready, Mrs. Coletto? She slipped her arm through his and leaned her head against his shoulder. Ready to spend the rest of my life loving you? Yes, I am. To hear about future audiobooks by Andrea Boyd, please subscribe below. For more information about Andrea Boyd and her books, visit andreaboyd11.com.